Hey, what's up? Welcome to Basecraft. So, I'm just back from a UK tour about a few weeks, but I recorded this podcast, I'd say, the week I came back. And you can actually see in the video, if you're watching it on YouTube, I have like big bags under my eyes. The tour wiped me out. I don't know, it's just after the break of two years from doing it properly. It just takes, it's taken its toll, you know, but hopefully I'll get more used to it. Really enjoyed it, but was so wrecked after it. Um, Some epic drives, like Plymouth to... Edinburgh near Edinburgh like that's 500 miles I'll put a picture up on the screen to show some of the, the drive like um I, that's absolutely killer but you know I'm not complaining I'm a little bit but not really uh you can't beat you know being on the road and getting to play loads of gigs in front of crowds so that's awesome no gigs in Ireland yet but a few coming up and um yeah that's what's going on in my world I I kind of had stopped practicing there for a while like wasn't really doing much shedding but then I'm playing the double bass a bit actually, which I never play. It's just like an ornament in my house. But um, a friend of mine started doing kind of a a monthly country music thing, playing like John Prine tunes. And he asked me would I bring the double bass and play it. And actually the first night of it, I brought the double bass, but I also brought an electric bass and amp because I was like, I don't even know, can I play this thing? And I never really got that into it or really put in the time to be able to play it properly but you know what i got away with it i didn't even need to use the electric bass so i'm going to start putting some hours into that and that kind of leads into today's guest cormac moore who has been in the late late show house band since 2009 so that's the late late show is like one of the longest running talk shows in the world it's the biggest one in ireland so he's played with loads of famous people like musicians and actors like russell crowe and um he's a fantastic electric bass player but he's took up the double bass in the last five years which he tells us all about in the podcast and um it was really interesting chatting to him and i got some tips off him you know where i could go with it and how i could get back into actually properly for the first time playing the double bass instead of just you know being a hack and just throwing throwing my hat at it like because it's the kind of instrument you can't just play without having good technique you need to know what you're doing so yeah Cormac is a class bass player I've seen him playing a bunch of times over the years and um, he as well as being in the Late Show band he, he was in like a comedy band the Cannon Bar Quartet and he's managed and played in loads of tribute bands over the years so really uh, interesting character being a professional musician his whole life pretty much and um well worth checking out so follow the links down below and i hope you enjoy the chat as usual follow me on instagram and all that stuff if you want to help me out you can throw some money in my tip jar buy a t-shirt or whatever i'm supposed to set up a patreon i didn't get around to it yet but i will um actually i was going to do this series of videos on youtube i had like i was going to do loads of them 30 in a month and i made like five of them that was like six months ago and i kind of stopped and haven't done one since so once i get them done i'll start the patreon and that'll be it so anyway enjoy the episode and i'll see you in a minute well if you're happy i'm happy i'm happy yeah what's the story i'm we're recording now anyway so what's up Man. how are you getting on i sure look we're getting there as they were you say. on the telly last night i was on the telly a little bit yeah i, I didn't watch <laughs> it It was valentine's day specials <laughs> they're nuts yeah well i don't um, really want i watched um, it lately a bit but not i would be more more tommy Tiernan i'd be watching but well, sure, look, I know. Um, uh, sure, you're a young man, as they say. <laughs> and not, not to put down the Late Late Show. But I'm not the a, target audience. It, it, well, I don't think so. Yeah, <laughs> I'm more the target audience, probably. Lads over their mid-40s. But um, yeah, no, uh, yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't too crazy last night. It was all right. It, wasn't too, it was tame enough. But uh, it has been mental on a, a Valentine's. But we've, we've only had a full audience back in the last two weeks or three weeks. So it's um, after two years, like so. Um, it's nice to have the audience back. It makes such a difference, my God. Because yeah. um, most of the time, like most of the playing we do, would probably be on the commercial breaks. You know, there's, you know yeah. yourself. Keep so, them entertained, like. Yeah, well, that's kind of like it's a lot of the job, really. It's it's kind of keeping the audience entertained. So, um, and without an audience, that's why we, well, there was no band there for eighteen months because there was no audience. Mm. So, um, so it's nice to be back, as they say. Yeah, because. I had Dave Swift on. He was saying it was actually easier without the audience because it was less pressure. But I suppose yeah. Jules Holland is all music with a little bit of chat. And yes. the show you're on is lots of chat with a little bit of music. That's exactly right. And I was listening to Dave because um, 
I, well, obviously, it's very interesting to listen to. I, I, and, you know, as, as I was saying to you beforehand, uh, I don't know how interesting I am, but uh, it, like Dave is, he's on a music show. Yeah, we're on a, a light entertainment show, I suppose, is what they call it. Um, and uh, so some weeks we wouldn't be playing with anybody in particular. We'd just be doing play ons, um, uh, which, well, yeah, a lot of like last night. Did we play with any? Oh, yeah, we were back in Cleona. Um, see, I forget. I forget. <laughs> the minute the show walk away. I, we were playing with Cleona Hagen last night, yeah. I get you to turn up your mic a bit, actually. You're, it's quite, well, okay. very quite low. How's that? That's better now, yeah. Yeah, it sounds, well, I'm listening to myself, so I can hear myself. But um, yeah, um, yeah, I forget. I forget. Like, it's like uh, Dave, Dave um, Swift gets to, um, yeah, he gets to play long pieces of music, several of them in a show. And uh, like, that's what musicians are used to or what they kind of aspire towards doing. And what we, what I suppose what the late late band does is slightly different in that you kind of have to do that and you have to do play ons, um, and play ons are kind of a different discipline, so to speak. They're like um, you know they're very short. You know you get you get three four counting usually and you're you're off and uh, mm. and you can make so many mistakes. <laughs> it's, it's like Jimmy Fallon that show, isn't it? The Questlove yeah. and the band they they do the play ons, yes. don't they? They do the play ons as well, yeah. Oh, they're fantastic, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, no, like if we if there was one a couple of shows at the end of last season that I did because the band weren't there, but they would uh, they I came in and did a couple of shows and um, and they were musical performances and it was so much more relaxing in a way because you could just mm. do some performances and um, like play on the problem with play ons and I, I was, as I was listening to Dave as well, you know, a lot of stuff pre prepared uh, with the late late, a lot of stuff is last minute. So play ons can change if guests change and if um, guests get pulled and, you know, you could have a game show or something where you have to play little stings and it's like, mm. um, so it's a, it, like what I would say about it is it's because we were, I was only discussing it with the band just some of the lads of the band yesterday. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of. It's kind of hard unless you, you've done it to kind of realize how stressful it is, I suppose, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> Especially stressful if you if you uh, do make a mistake and you mm. go home, and you go, God, I don't know what's that show in case, you know, like, and it usually is a tiny little thing. But uh, um, yeah, it's like the MD has a lot of on his shoulders when he's counting in, you know, mm. guests live on a television show. And, sh- and we've had guests on the show that, you know, uh, famously, uh, Peter Kay would never tell you what he was going to do. And he'd come on and just start singing songs. And <laughs> you just have to play along. You know, yeah, that's that's a bit. Yeah, that's a bit of stress. Uh, well, it, it can be. I mean, it, usually they're fairly straight. Like you know, he, he starts singing the Saw Doctors. That's grand. You know, all that kind of stuff. So usually, like you know, we've been doing it a long time, so it's grand. But but yeah, it, it's not like the feeling in the pit of your stomach goes away uh, just because you've done it a million times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've been doing it a long time how many years have you been in I suppose to give context for anyone who's not from Ireland we should explain what this show is it's the longest right. running talk show in the world I think is it I Late think that I've heard tell I think it's the 60th birthday um, this year this se- or is, yeah this season so I think there's some sort of big bash at the end of the season I'm not sure um, yeah 60 years so I don't know that's what 62 is that right mm. um, yeah 62 yeah um, so it's been running probably as long as television has been running in Ireland nearly. Um, yeah. But, um, and they're only on their third host. Is that right? Uh, yes. um, yeah, I think so. Pat Kenny, yeah. uh, Gabe Byrne, Pat Kenny and Ryan, yeah. And Ryan Tuberty, who's the lad, um, that, uh, the, the fellow that I've been working with for the last uh, 10 years. Is it 10 years? 2010. So that's uh, 12 years. But we, we lost 18 months, as I said, in the pandemic, unfortunately. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's a long run chat show. It's it's a weird one. Uh, it's because it's not strictly a ch- talk show that people in other countries be used to where, you know, you have guests on um, most. And, and like I, I did call it light entertainment earlier, but it's it's more a mixture of light entertainment and serious stuff. Um, hmm. The original host, Gay Byrne, was there for 40 years or something, I think. And he um, his thing was to because Ireland was a very different place in 1962. Um, it was to introduce issues and talk about issues um, and and a, lo- a lot of modernization happened in this country in the last even the last 20 years but certainly in, in the last 60 years and I think for a long time the show was seen as that um, during his tenure certainly as um, a, 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 it was a big well television was bigger back then anyway I mean you know even in America everywhere in the world uh, television was you know market share was like you know shows would have 70 percent or whatever I don't yeah. know what you know, the many options. Shows. We only had one channel in Ireland for years, so like, yeah, I had to watch it. Like, 
Well, that's it. Yeah. And it was what we talk about. Well, I don't know if we talk about it in the schoolyard in the 80s, but uh, maybe when we were a bit older, we talk about it if we watched it. But then people who have lives don't watch t- chat shows on Friday nights, I suppose, when they're young fellas. Um, so, yeah, you're out and about. Uh, that's it. Like yourself, Stephen. No, not, uh, I'm not as young as you think I am. I don't, <laughs> I don't be out on a Friday. I'd be inside. <laughs> well, hopefully you'd be gigging on a Friday. That's the other thing. That's, that's yeah, what I haven't done an Irish gig in ages now. I've been back and forth to England a lot, but the Irish okay, gigs yeah. it just haven't been happening. They haven't actually, have they? It's it's taken a bit longer here. We we are a bit, um, well, I mean, like rightly so. We're just we've opened up a bit slower, maybe as well. Um, and but we're getting there now. Um, but um, because I haven't even been doing a lot of gigging really. Um, and I kind of do. I know you you yourself do a lot of touring and your with, with your own band and stuff. Um, I kind of tend to play with all all over the place with here here there and everywhere in Ireland mm. with, for a, events mostly and functions and things and. Uh, uh, they haven't come, they only just started to come back like i'm doing a wedding tonight for god's sake i oh, think that's nice. the first one in <laughs> well, certainly the first one this year anyway Wait, weddings so, can be strange can't they sometimes they're like there'd be a great buzz but when it's a bad wedding it's the worst game of your life because you're like well the, it can, the, if, it, yeah if the families don't like each other or something. yeah no, i don't know about that but i know a guy he's in a, a rock wedding band and he said someone came up to him and said you're shite You've after you've ruined my daughter's wedding. It's the worst wedding I've ever been to, and they're like, "Well, yes. didn't even apologize." They're like, "We're a rock band, like so. What well, do you want? You like, that's what was booked." <laughs> yeah, no, I, like it's a, it's, a, it's um um. I think that RT did it, or the Doc on One, you know, the radio show did a, mm. a, a thing on wedding singers or wedding bands, and um, they they had a couple of different people on, but one guy was an old guy, you know, who's been doing it all his life, and. He was like the day his mother died. He had to organize somebody for the wedding that night, and it, it, they, you know, because it is someone's special day as well. But like, yeah. it's that's the thing for a band. It's like it's pressure. Mm, yeah, <laughs> you know, like you say, somebody comes up and says that to you, you're you're kind of like, oh god, pack the van, let's get out of here. <laughs> I, get it. I get paid. Do we get paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, jeez, it can happen. All right, yeah, God help us. But um, yeah, well, they're back. I think this year anyway. So. Um, I'll have a bit of work. I, I, I'm, I'm not like yourself. I haven't done an awful lot of touring abroad. Um, um, the odd bit, you know yourself. You get a corporate event in Dubai, yeah. or you get, a, you know, a, a, a birthday party in in London or something, that kind mm. of thing. Um, but um, I've, I've tended to do a lot of my, well, like I've, I've been, I've been on the late late since 2010. But I was on a TV show before that with Ryan. The, the host had a TV show before that, and we were on it um, with him on a Saturday night, and that was since 2004. So it kind of blocks out the diary a lot. Yeah, it's very normal like, for you to be on telly. Like after all these years, it you don't you just like for some of my for my myself, if I was to tell my mother I'm going to be on the late late <laughs> show on Friday night, it would be like <laughs> amazing. But at this yes. stage, you're probably so used to just being on the telly all the time. And I'm not even sure if my mother knows that I'm on or off it now at this stage herself, because <laughs> it's like, are you are you working at all? Or yeah, you, you know, because I haven't been working. But um, yeah, no, it is. It's yeah, I, I yeah, it becomes kind of um, you get used to it, all right, as to say. Um, it's a, uh, well, uh, but but yeah, it's a funny thing because um, a lot of people like the, if I do get recognized, let's say I'm I'm not recognized, like people don't recognize me. But the odd time somebody will come up to me in the street and say, and and think it's me. But it's actually the they they mistake me for the keyboard player because they think we're brothers. <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I actually saw um, you at a gig years ago, about twenty years ago, when I worked in um, a pharmaceutical factory in Clonmel Abbott. Oh yeah, the Cannon Bar Quartet came down, and I hated the job. It was awful. Like working in a factory yeah. it was so boring. But you were a great crack. You took the absolute pit. The CEO is obviously yes. American. They're an American company. <laughs> I remember it. Yeah, and you did sing- a couple of gigs there. Your singer was ripping the piss out of the CEO. And he wasn't yeah. loving, loving it one bit, and it was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> it's great for the um, employees, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then we were never booked again. <laughs> I think we did it about three times that gig. I think we did it. We used to do it once a year for a little while. Um, yeah, Paddy's great crack with the. Uh, he's that 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 band is like kind of my my like that was the band that became the Late Late Show House band, and that was uh, we came kind of came from him. Well, like we came from a. Uh, my background was uh, where I met Paddy, who was the lead singer of that band, was in um, art college. So we we kind of started out as kind of a well, it's, I suppose like uh, it was it was more like a bit of crack, and it was kind of like musical comedy more than anything else. Mm. Um, but Paddy happens to be a fantastic singer and a great musician. Like he's he's very musical, so um, uh, he kind of drew myself and him went to college to, and him went to college together, and then we, we kind of we used to play for the people in. We used to put together shows 
in the college and it'd be crazy like you know you know to be people dressed up as Dorothy out of Wizard of Oz and you know <laughs> um with, with a little um dog on a roller skate Toto and a rainbow there was a great fella that used to dress up as Artie um, um, with a little rainbow over his head and everything it was brilliant um, singing wizard, you know, songs from the Wizard of Oz with us backing them and then you'd have you know it was all sorts of craziness like it was in our college so we used to book out wheelings and just go mental and everyone from the college would come and uh, it was brilliant crack um, and it was kind of like a sideline it was like you know we were doing degrees at the time so we didn't you know I kind of I fell into this job in a way, you know. Mm. Anyway. But was it but fine art degree. or was it what kind of sculpture or fine art you were doing? I was, I was, well, I wanted to be a painter when in first year and then uh, they ended up stream putting me into ceramics, which I was kind of going, what's this about? But I ended up doing more or less, it was sculpture then. So ceramics, ceramics is kind of, you know, working with clay. So um, we had to do pottery and stuff like that as well as uh, in second year and stuff like that. But then you could kind of specialize in what you wanted to do. So it was, it worked out well for me in the end um, in that I got to do something that more fine arty than crafty, if you know what I mean. Mm. But um, no, I love college. I was brilliant, but I'm obviously not working in that job now. No, the news <laughs> got in the way of the art. It, it, well, yeah, it was, well, when I came out of college, I found it very hard. I mean, it, I'm sure a lot of musicians say this, younger fellas say this to you, you know, how, how do I do this job? How do I make it? You know, how do I, yeah. you know, pay for the rent and mm. and do something in the arts, let's say. Um, and like, that's one thing I'd say about art, artists and musicians and anyone who works uh, or actors or anyone who works in the arts. I mean, there, it's a very similar kind of path. There's no one path and there's no, no way, nobody's going to be able to tell you how to do it. Um, and when I left college, it was the mid nineties and things had, hadn't really gotten like, like, if you think music is bad, try, um, try doing art for a living. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> like it's tough. Like you're, you're relying on like grants and getting like art yeah. festivals to fund you for six months to do a project or something like that. It isn't like. Yeah. And like, and like uh, another thing about it, I think that's different as well is that it's more solitary. Uh, that's the thing that I think, um, that's brilliant about music is that it's all it's and it's it, the quicker you realize it in music i think the better is that it's collaborative and and it's about a network and it's about you know your friends whether whether it's even if it's playing a wedding or it's but it, or it's writing an album or it's uh touring it's it's about hanging out with your friends and kind of everybody putting their work together to make something better and mm. uh and if you don't have that network i mean you, you can you know even solo artists you can think of solo artists but i mean you can guarantee that um they're there because they met the right people and they learned from good people or they had good teachers or they had good friends that supported them and helped them and and you know from whatever element whether it be mental health or just you know um being the a drummer in their band or whatever everybody has to rely on other people so it's you know and, and when you're an artist i i couldn't i suppose the other thing about it was when i left our college i was like i was i did feel lonely i felt like it was a kind of a um you know, you're, and I, I wasn't the, uh, I'm, I'm more of a shy type person. I'm not one of these, uh, I've developed a little bit. I'm a bit better now than I was when I was mm. 18, let's say, but, um, you know, I, uh, I, it felt like a very hard furrow to plow uh, by mm. yourself coming straight out of our college into the art world, let's say. And, and I happened to be getting gigs and, you know, it was a bit of crack and it was a bit of money in it. And yeah. it was, it was easier on my head. I Were suppose. you making pieces of art? Like, I yeah even though were you doing, like getting into it like doing doing um projects and get ready for i don't know um what did they have like exhibitions, exhibitions yeah. Yeah. I, like you know well that's that's the thing i was i had i rented a studio down um, near me in rat mines and i had um i was making peace and i was and i was like this is this is the grim part i was like on the dole but i was on a false course that gave you an extra bit on the dole to kind of help you along to do things like that which was brilliant you know because um i think that that support that you can get, you know, I spent about two years on the dole, let's say, um, after college and it allowed you to kind of do, it's, it's great for musicians and artists to, yeah. to just, they don't, you see, but I, I, they don't sit at home doing nothing. But some of them do, I'm sure. Mm. But most people need that. I think it's the good thing about this country that there is a bit of support there that you don't feel like, like I could, well, back then you could pay the rent and you could live just about and you could make, like I was paying rent on a studio as well out of that and, as well as the rent I was living like, and rents were a lot cheaper then. And yeah. that's something I think in the nineties, things were a lot cheaper and it was much, it was, it made it a much more um, fun time and made it easier for artists and our musicians to do whatever, whatever they wanted to do. And, uh, but ultimately after a couple of years of that night, and, and, and I did do an exhibition and um, it was a group exhibition stuff. Um, I think it was just, a, it was more of a, 
a mental health thing. I think I was just kind of ground down by it. I couldn't, I found that the music was easier for me, um, head wise. And like I said, it was, it was, I was doing it with my friends and I was, yeah. you know, and I found it hard to kind of, I just needed to take a break, I think. Um, and ultimately what happened within a year or so of doing that is that I had loads of work and I kind of really enjoyed it. I said, you know, well, there's no point in me just trying to fool myself and trying to do two things at once here. I'll just do the music and see how it goes. Mm. And it, it went really well um, in terms of um, I had loads of work and I was making money and I was able to pay bills and I was having fun. So um, that's what happened there. And uh, I always felt like, I mean, like that's, that was the, the old career path in the 60s for all the English bands, wasn't it? It was like go to art school and end up in a band like John Lennon. Yeah, you know? yeah. I was just thinking you were a bit like John Lennon there, like going to art college and then just go, doing the music instead. Yeah, well, you know, and uh, like my parents were very supportive about, um, I mean, for God's sake, I, was, I went to art college. Like, you know, it wasn't like I was going to go to do accountancy. It was like, you know, they, they didn't say to me, Jesus, we're very worried about you. They were expecting you to be broke. Like they were like, oh, sure, yeah. leave them off. Yeah, and like I'm from a farm in Kilkenny. Like I don't know where you're from, Steve. Farm, but you yeah, know, farm as well. So, <laughs> no, and and most of the lads I went to college with, or and and a lot of the girls that I went to college, girls and guys that I went to college with, were from, you know, backgrounds that, um, like that. You know, you get the grant and you come up from the farm and you and you, you and that's another great thing about and uh, you know having a relatively free education. It was you know you had to pay your rent and stuff, but um, the college course itself didn't cost much, um, and it was. Uh, four years as well and it was brilliant um but uh yeah so like look it was uh like it didn't turn out exactly the way i expected to but then what 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 does in this business you know yourself exactly like i had pretty much given up on music uh when i was in that job in abbott like yeah. i just went and got went to college to do like a science degree and i had no yeah. intentions of go- yeah doing music in any kind of way but just the bands kept getting you know doing better and yeah. better and by the end of the college i was making I live in doing the band thing and I didn't need the degree, but I'd given up on any ambitions to be a full-time musician at that stage. Like, Isn't it funny, isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Cause like, like, and, and that's often the case, isn't it? It's like, but you know, you obviously had the, uh, I, again, I'd say for myself, I think a lot of the, we're, we're bass players. So, but I think there is a kind of a type that is a bass player. A lot of the time it's like a person that kind of is that kind of collaborative type of person and, mm. and doesn't have maybe as much as e- ego as the, as the, uh, lead singer let's say or you know okay it's it's a bit of a cliche it's but true. you know lead singers and guitarists like they're well you know in i kind of want them to have a bit of an ego <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> it's you need that up the yeah front. you kind of I mean, need I'm it like you know you're man. not if you're shy and reserved you're probably not going to be the best lead singer anyway like so yeah and and, and sometimes they are shy like off stage but when yeah. you're on stage you want to have that you know i mean i get into it on stage i love it like um and and maybe that was another thing about it as well is that you know you can't perform a as easily as an artist you there's there are certain things like performance art and stuff arts and stuff like that but you know it is kind of a solitary pursuit i mean so is you, you practice your instrument at home for, for hours if you want but then ultimately you get to go in front of people and mm. all going well um for the good weddings and um, people are going mental and having the great having the crack um and if they're not you're still enjoying the music yeah. if you're not enjoying the music you probably shouldn't be there but, you still enjoy the gigs, like you know, you're you're not. Yeah. You, you enjoy yeah. every gig. You still enjoy doing. Kind of do, yeah. I'd, I'd be honest with you, yeah. Well, like that's if, class, if, like. Yeah, like you know, like I, I can't be highfalutin about it. What I do is, you know, I'm playing covers most of the time, and, you know, you can put your own spin on it and you put your own bit of yourself into it and whatever. But ultimately, like I'm, I'm not John Lennon. I didn't write any Beatles albums so far, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, it's kind of like going back to what I did in college, like it's a craft thing. Playing the bass itself is kind of a craft more than an art. Um, yeah. if you ask me. Um, I like the element of it myself. Like, you know, you know that you're getting yeah. better all the time and you put, yeah, you putting the hours in the shed and you know, you're getting well, that's better. The thing, isn't it? Yeah. And, and like when I was in college doing ceramics, a lot of the fine artists would be coming down to ceramics to, to, to check out some of the techniques we were using to make things because there was a big movement in the sixties to get rid of kind of education the old art education where it was all about drawing and it was very stale and it was very classical and in a, it's very similar to what we have in music these in, we've we struggled with in music in the last couple of decades um that uh they did that they did that in the art schools in the 60s and then but like the craft department in all these places still you, you can't work with clay unless you have techniques to to deal with it you can't yeah. work with certain materials like uh bronze or whatever 
um, unless you you have to learn how to weld if you're going to use steel and and they're they're the craft elements of it it means that and, and what i think i think craft can bring so much to an it, an art form is nothing without a bit of craft we all know that anyway because you know yourself you, you in any band you love they have something about them that's you know you know if you have, if you've got a brilliant band like queen let's say like freddie mercury is an awesome singer and that's a craft that's yeah. not that doesn't mean he's going to write great songs. He happened to write great songs as well, you know. But and and like Paddy in in the Camembert, he um he was a brilliant singer, um, and that's a craft. I don't know where he got it from, or who taught it to him, or how he learned it. You know, like you know, I'm self-taught as well, so I didn't have a teacher, mm. but um he had it, and then he, he decided to use it to do what well, what we did a lot of what was, was was comedy with it. But um um so there's a there's a craft element to everything you do, and and if you know you kind of want that tech you have to have some technical ability or it's you know it's it's very rare you find somebody who's a brilliant songwriter who can't hardly play and can hardly sing you know mm, but um, bob dylan gets slagged for that a lot but you know, yeah bob dylan gets that slagging a lot that he can't <laughs> sing but he, he actually can like i think he i think he dumbs it down a bit yeah I think he, he's playing a character most of the time isn't he yeah it's a character like uh, one second go and turn off my heater before i suffocate i, I, okay, I turned on. on to give myself a blast of heat before we started and i forgot to turn it off <laughs> i know the feeling but uh it's a good analogy you make because it's kind of like you know the way you were saying they have to learn the techniques how to mold the different ceramics and stuff it's the yeah. same in music if you don't have yeah, good technique exactly. you can't express yourself like you you can't yeah. get out what's in your head like yeah, forgive the pun. There's a baseline of technique you, you need to be able to express yourself in most things, and uh, and and uh, every every and I'm aware as well that every time you say something like that, there's going to be somebody that'll break that rule. You know that, um, uh, like I said, there there are people who probably um, have a great songwriting talent. Like I'm I'm not a good singer, but you know you could put pro- I can put a melody together. I can't sing a bloody thing very well, or nobody wants to listen to me singing it. Mm. You know. Um, so you can always, that's the other thing about the collaborating, you can always hire somebody else to help you. So that's, that's what bass players, I, I always make that point to other people as well. They ask me, um, uh, you know, if, if say, for instance, a bass player needs work, he has to find a drummer. He can't go out there, you know, generally. People yeah. don't want to hear the bass without a drummer, no. really, you know. Like I, I, I was saying to somebody recently, you know, uh, in order for me to work, I need two to three other people to, you know, agree to be there with me on the night yeah it's the nature of the instrument like it's cla- i'm doing yeah. ma- performance masters at the moment and i have yeah. to do a gig like and i'm i'm, I'm saying Gee, this is a lot of stress because no matter how much good i am i still need a singer guitarist bass a uh, drummer i need other musicians to come with yeah. me on this like and yeah it, it, that i, I know, find that like, element of being a bass player is stressful sometimes like because no matter how good you do your homework you're still relying on a singer could just you, play you the whole gig without bad, the band. Yeah. Yeah, like if the singer goes to the the middle eight before you, you know you're you're you have to follow him, and it mm. makes it sound like you made a mistake, even though he did or she did. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and that's a small, you know. Yeah, you're right. It's it's uh and going yeah as a bass player, you, that's why we're like I suppose, you know. I mean, I don't know how you feel about Stephen, but like when I was a kid, I always listened to the bass for some reason, and I don't know why that is. I mean, you will have to get Freud in or something <laughs> and figure that one yeah. out. <laughs> well, why, why had you that obsession with the low end it's maybe something yeah, to do with like, the farm the tractors or something that... <laughs> maybe it is and, and like i didn't start i didn't pick up a bass till i was 18 like so mm. like somebody left it in my house and 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 i oh but i always knew in my head i always thought i love that instrument i love the sound of it um um maybe drums might be a, a, a second to it as well uh, you know percussion stuff because it is a percussive instrument the bass as well but um but I always loved, I always, and I knew when I picked it up for the first time, I said to myself, I kind of understand this, you know? Mm. Um, uh, now, I obviously looking back on it, but I was able to play something on it more or less straight away. But like, you know, because it it's a lifetime, like, and you still wouldn't know nothing. Uh, no, it's say. crazy, isn't it? Well, how how yeah. was the earliest you became aware of music? Like, was there music in your family or, because uh, I, I didn't play bass till I was 18, 17 or 18 either. Like, and, You're the same as myself. Wow. Yeah. And I didn't even own a CD till I was 16. So it was very late <laughs> getting into music, like. Yeah, like I was, I suppose, um, I was into music. Like there was always music on in the house. Like there was always RT Ron playing in the corner. Like the radio is still never off in the kitchen, you know, and you'd spend most of your time there. So I remember as a kid, like I got a Christmas present and of, of Beethoven's fifth. I think it was about my fifth birthday. And my mother got it for me. I don't know. She, I must have been home along to it or something. I don't know. Um, and I used to love that. But like we had all loads of old records at home, I think. Um, like I remember there was Sousa, 
like marches and things. There was old 78s and we had an old 78 player and there was all these old things, probably from my father's um, sisters and stuff. Had, they were like, they're from the 60s and the 50s, some of them. Um, and uh, we broke most of them probably. They were all made out of slate and as kids, but we did listen to them as well as break them. And they all musicals and stuff like that. Um, like uh, the Little Prince, or well, the Little Prince, what was it called? Jeez, I can't even remember the name of some of them. We just put them on, we wouldn't know the name. And, and I remember specifically uh, one of the reasons why when we were doing the musical comedy thing about 20 years ago, um, we had the Muppet Show cast album from, the, it was in the 70s now. And I loved that because it was all sorts of genres of music and it was great crack. Mm. And and it was really well played, actually, listening back to it. It was this, the, the Muppet Show was filmed in London and they had like a, uh, a group of London session players like doing all the stuff and uh, you know so yeah I remember that kind of stuff loving all of that and we'd, we, I'd, I'd play that record again and again and again you know yourself um, and, uh, and when we were kids we loved things like ABBA and, and the Beatles and all that stuff on which the all had great bass lines about all those pop stars like unbelievable the, yeah I, I can't remember the name of ABBA's bass player but my god brilliant um, and, and the Beatles I mean McCartney Sure, you can't go wrong, can you? No, because um, you can sing everything he plays, can't you? It's um, it's so melodic. So you know, like there was always music there, and like there was an old piano, and my mother would tinker on it, and she she used to play when she was younger, I think. But I never really saw her play it very much, and there was bits of music there, and I just pot her about in that. But it was way out of tune, still there, and it's way it's a it's probably in about a, a semitone flat the whole thing, mm. and that's it, at at the good parts of it, um, and. Uh, so I think around, I, I, I did love it. That's the thing, I suppose. I always loved the, I loved drawing and painting and listening to music I, I, when I was a kid. And, um, and you know, when I was in school, I, 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 I did well. I used to study until about, until my interest started. And after that, I kind of lost interest in study and stuff. I just got into art and I said to myself, I, I remember I went up to the open day in NCD and um, I said, I want to come here. This is what I want to do because I just, I knew it, the way, I just wanted to do something I, I enjoyed and, you know, um, and even though I wasn't a musician yet or I didn't play an instrument, I, I, I always loved music as well. They, they do go hand in hand. There's, there's something about them, I don't know, um, cognitively or whatever, that it just suited my brain type. And mm. um, so I, I was, you know, and obviously when you're in art college as well, like all you do is listen to crazy music. Yeah, um, hang out with all creative types and you're getting in. yeah you're just it's just Lunatics. all around you like yeah, music and art and everyone it's a, it's a melting pot i suppose isn't it it's it's a fantastic place you know i mean it's you know and i was talking to an old lecturer of mine about five years ago i met him at a gig and he said um you were in the you were in the right place at the right time it was a great time to be there because there was you know like i was saying to you earlier the 90s was a much easier time to go to college in dublin i was from kilkenny it was like the, you know um uh, don't want to cast aspersions, but the minute I could get out of there and get up to Dublin, the, you know, I, mm. I did it. Um, and I really didn't look back and that, you know, I, I really loved it. It was just, I found my people, I suppose, as well. Like, I suppose we all do at, so, at that age. Or we hope, you know, I, I certainly hope for my my kids when they're, they're that age, they find that groove of, you know, the right people and the things they're interested in because it's a great, it's a great thing to be interested in anything these days. Um, mm. You know, you can get distracted so easily by, my young fella plays Dylan pipes and, and God help me. I don't know how that happened, but, um, cause I, Strange, like I was saying to add big up like, <laughs> yeah, it's, and he's fantastic, but, uh, I'm just delighted. He has something that he's interested in that yeah. he can, you know, you know, like music is great like that. Um, and these days there's no certainty about anything. Is there, you could, you could go and study accountancy and then a robot has got your job in five years time, you know, yeah. there's no, well, I've, se I've seen those robot bands. See, did you ever see them? They were playing like motor Motorhead or something. They were absolutely oh. terrible. <laughs> like, so yeah. our, our job should be saved for oil. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, that's the thing the pandemic has taught us, hopefully, that people want to, well, you know, they're starting to come back to gigs now. And um, I mean, how did you find your, you, you were just touring there recently, weren't you? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, really good. But people are still a bit apprehensive to come out like, and they're mm. even at the gigs, they're apprehensive to go a bit mad. They're like, is it okay? Because remember, they had the rule: you're not allowed to dance for a while. Oh or, yeah. So that the people are very reserved, like more than they used to be. So it'll take a while yeah. for them to get back to normal. But you can see the excitement of them when they're getting to see a bit of live music finally. But even for me, like I, when you have all these people coming up, shaking your hands and hugging you and close talking to you, I'm finding that hard to get used to again. Like, cause it's like I, I spent two years in this shed, like practically. 
Wow. Yeah, I know it's, it's definitely true. I mean, we're still social distancing on, on the late, late. And uh, even though the audience is back, the first two rows aren't there just in case. I mean, I think we're nearly there. It's, I mean, there's a, but uh, yeah, it's still, you're right. It's it's going to take a couple of months, I hope. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think like, about I, it as much anymore myself. Like I caught the COVID on the tour yeah. last November tour. Yeah. And I just don't, yeah. I, I don't seem to think about it anymore. It's just like, oh, it's whatever. Well, like, like a lot of us have had it. I've had, I had it a year ago and, and like a lot of people are have, have had it twice now. And, you know, um, they've had the, the milder strain and they're vaccinated and it's not such a big deal. And it's like a cold now. And I, I know loads of people have had it recently because, and part of me is like, that's the, the, I suppose the anxiety, I suppose is like, I'm going to do a TV show. I have to do an antigen test every time. And it's, it's just such a, it can mess up everything uh, mm. at the moment, but it's not, uh, just the fear isn't there. Like, um, I wouldn't have the fear that, uh, you know, it's going to harm you or whatever. Mm, uh, just mess up your I know that doesn't go for everybody, but um, but for me anyway, certainly. Uh, and uh, it's just going to take a while to get used to. But like, I'm dying to go to gigs myself. Um, mm. Whatever about um, uh, playing them. I, I enjoy, don't get me wrong, I'm going to enjoy playing them. I'm going to enjoy, you know, playing a wedding and playing, I'm playing in a restaurant tomorrow and I'm, I was doing the late, late last night and I'm I like, this is the first weekend I'm kind of going, I'm actually back to where I was, what I used to do, you know, um, and uh, and I love it. Like like I said to you at the beginning, I I, I mean I don't know. Do you, have you asked other guests this question? Like like I I generally when I'm doing a gig, I do enjoy it, even if it's the gig's not going particularly well. I can find something to enjoy out of it. You know yourself. I, I, I don't know. I'd say you're quite unique in that way. Like because I've often yeah. dated a gig like and <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, like I'd think you're. I don't know. Is everyone like that? That's it's, you're lucky to enjoy. I suppose sometimes if I, if it's a bad gig, I'll I'll say, oh let's I'm going to experiment tonight. I'll yeah I'll I'll yeah. use one finger on my left hand or something. Yeah, yeah. just to, no, to me. I'll I'll play, with that. Yeah. I'll play with a plectrum for the whole gig, even though I'm not yeah. really a plectrum player as much. Or but yeah. that's unique. I think that you enjoy every gig. Like that's you're looking. Well, I mean, way. I suppose the stakes aren't as high. Maybe if if I'm not playing my own music, mm. the stakes aren't as high. You know, like. I tell you what, the only thing that I suppose that does get me maybe a bit sometimes is nerves if it's live television and, um, yeah, there, there's, there's never a time I go, I do the late, late where I'm not, um, there's not some sort of element of, it's not like a normal gig. There's always something where you kind of think to yourself, right, you have your, I mean, I, 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 I list out everything that I have to play that night because it changes all the time and everything. It might be changing an hour before the show. And, um, but when the MD goes three, four, you know, to count you in, if you don't, it's happened to me where your mind goes blank and goes, what the, f- what is this? And you look at the iPad and you go, okay. Uh, but you know, like, I, I, I wonder, um, I'd love there to be, in my ideal world, it would be like every piece of that you're playing is written out for you with the bar number, the count in, you know, mm. and it's, it's written so that, you, you know, you could read every part, but there's never time to do that. And, you know, I'm not fast at writing things anyway. Uh, do you read and, like, uh, are you a reader like? I do read, but I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not going to be sight reading Teen Town or anything, but mm. you know, I can read like, um, uh, I've managed to teach myself that much, um, to, you know, to a standard where, you know, if it was a, a play on or something, your standard pop rock thing is not going to be a problem. Like, um, mm. and certainly if I've written it out myself, I'll know what it is, but, uh, um, but you never have time to do that. And the MD certainly doesn't have time to do that. He doesn't have time to do it for himself. Um, you know, um, it's, it's, I kind of, when, when Dave Swift was talking about Jules, I was kind of envious. I was like, at least he gets a heads up um, generally. What for, song is uh, going to be coming up? Yeah. Yeah. And like, you can kind of write it like he, he's, he's great. Cause he writes everything out, doesn't he? And he's yeah, he, every, uh, by hand. He has, he's, he's charts. Yes. And he's a, he's a, a great reader and, a, and, a, and I've seen looking at the charts. He's, a, he's, he's great at writing it out as well. Very clear and, and looks great. And um, you know, it, that I have done that for, for even, if I have to do a mime and say there's there's a because the drummer you know oftentimes in the late late it's live vocal to track and you're doing a mime um and the bass player has an easy job in that situation it's like um generally nobody's zooming in on your fingers mm. and you know if you're because as you know it's a rhythmic instrument so if you're if you're doing boom t- boom boom are you going boom ba- boom 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 nobody's going to notice your right hand with the camera on it even you won't no. even know if you're miming that, whereas the drummer, the poor old drummer has to make sure every crash symbol and every tom <laughs> is in the right place. Um, like uh, Ray, or the old drummer, the late, late, used to write out every mime. You have to write the whole thing out because 
you know, and have it on his on his floor, Tom, because mm, that's otherwise hole, it'll just get it, caught. Like... It's uh, and it's you know, but um, at least with a mime or something like that, or a piece of music, usually we would get a piece of music at least a day in advance. So, um, it's it's now the, the odd time, like I said, Peter Kay will come in and say I'm doing a few hymns that I used to do in the church when I was a kid, and I won't. I might tell you the name of the hymn, but I'm not going to tell you what key it is and what part of it is. I'm going to sing, and you just start singing it. And he won't even know what key it's in and we have to find it, you know, that has happened a few times. Um, and, uh, and that's a bit nerve wracking, but, um, but generally uh, if it's, uh, if it's a piece of three minute piece of music, we'll, we'll get, we'll get it on the Wednesday maybe, or we might even get it a week or in advance if it's with the orchestra or something like that. So, um, and sometimes we'll even get charts, which is great. Um, makes life a lot easier. And like I said, if it's, it's only say sometimes if you're doing a double bass thing or something where, you're standing right behind the, the singer and you, you, I, I just know from experience now that like I'm going to get caught on this if I don't you know I, it's just I'm too it, I'm too exposed to not write it out so that mm. I, I look um like I know I'm not miming it basically and it's funny it's often the things you're not miming that people you, I, I don't go on Twitter because I, I just don't have the time for it but I, I don't generally do social media but our, our, our old MD Jim used to always have the Twitter feed open when we'd be playing and he'd be like laughing just to laugh because of the yeah. trolls you know Getting um, abused. if you're on a show like the late late everyone hates you it's yeah. just <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the course <laughs> it's part of the course I mean musicians aren't too impressed with you um because you've got you've got a good gig and <laughs> <laughs> not trusting aspersions musicians you're all great um <laughs> we like um, everyone likes to slag off other people anyway maybe <laughs> yeah and like there's all look and i'll be the first to admit it there's always a better bass player out there that'll be going you know but well, i could do that gig that'd be you know i mean and, and there is i mean i'm not saying i'm the best bass player in the world by any stretch of the imagination um an element of it is definitely being is, is definitely luck and i'm able to do the job and i was in the right place in the right time and i managed to keep the job and that's probably the real truth of it um but like, you know, it's, it's when I'm singing a live back and vocal that you get the, look at your man miming. <laughs> <laughs> look at the bass player's miming. And it's, it's when you're singing the live. I didn't even live. know he mimed, to be honest. But that, now I know oh, I'll be go, watching now. out. Like I'll be Well, it, it doesn't happen all the time. I mean, a lot of the time it is live. Uh, but, you know, you know it, the, the thing is like, and this is the reason that we, there's a lot of mimes, is that if there's three musical acts on, they just don't have the channels and the setup to do, to swap out three different unless it's the same band playing the three parts and there's you know just a, a singer flying in to, flown in like we did a james bond thing there a while back and we did three james bond song, songs with with um a load of strings and brass and it's just three different singers but the, the band was the same so it was fine and that was all completely live um and that and like i obviously everyone prefers that um because it's you know that's what you're you, you don't get into this gig to be miming but mm. you know, it's just a nature of the business on television. A lot of the time, it's live oak the track because it's just a logistics thing more than anything else. Um, um, but like I said, sometimes you have to write the bloody thing out anyway, and yeah. or you certainly have to listen to it and you know know what you're doing because you're going to get caught. If there's a little bass figure for a bar, there's going to be a camera on you for that. Well, mm. you know, um, there's never a camera on the bass for the amount of times I'm trying to transcribe something on YouTube, but I'm like. Oh, I'm not sure what the bass player is doing. And you'd be thinking they'd zoom in on him when he's doing the lick or the fill, but no, they're looking yeah. at the drummer or the guitarist or something. Well, this is why we need, yeah. Um, even though our director in the Lele Show is a bass player, um, <laughs> that's why we need more musician directors. <laughs> but it's it's a hard gig. I mean, you've got four cameras and, and they, they write out a script for every bar. Um because my my wife works used to work um, doing the it's called a BCO it's a position in in um, who sits beside the, the director and the producer in the box and BCO has to get if there's a piece of music they have to break down every all they get all the lyrics and they break down every bar and uh, and they write the lyrics starting at each bar for the director to put the shots in so that, you know the, there's a person in the box counting every bar when they're when they're shooting those things so there you know there's a lot of moving parts but it, you know they, they try to do that you know depends on uh, you know a good night or a bad night they try and catch all those little things so you're but, saying you know, when your wife used to do that job she had a load of notes saying zoom in on karma here basically yeah. <laughs> all the best shots I can't, she only she only worked i think she worked on the late late for a little while but usually wasn't on the show i was on i remember once she had to do a concert orchestra gig and there was this um there was loads of pieces with really difficult time signatures in it so she was 
she was tearing the ear off me going, what's this? What's that? Because she had to write it out. Mm. And I was like, geez, you know, look, this is what I think it is. I'm not going to, you know, because they wouldn't, she might get the score for one of the pieces. And then there was this guy, um, this Piper guy, Galician fella, Car- Carlos Nunes, and he was doing this piece. And I swear to God, I couldn't count it. I was just, what the hell is going on here? Free it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. It was just, um, and you no, know, the easiest thing would have been, of course, to have the score, but she didn't have the scores. So I think she had the score for one piece. Um, but generally it was okay, but like, yeah. So, and like, like these, you know, she, in that job, you're not trained. I think you do like a little module on how to count bars and that's it. <laughs> there you Is go. Is she that's, a musician? That's like... you, no. No. That's crazy. You know what I mean? <laughs> there you go. And like some people, you know, she'd be fairly decent at it. Um, for a non-musician, she's excellent at it. But like some people have no, you know, as you know yourself, some people yeah. are musical and some people aren't. So, but that's their job. So it's an interesting, um, yeah, an interesting job. There's something we could fall back on, Stephen. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Counting away. <laughs> but uh, you do end up with some interesting people you're playing with on like someone like yeah. the Jules Holland show, which is always obviously musical guests, but you've backed up yeah. like Russell Crowe and yes. people like, is there ever any interesting situations when you're backing up these kind of guests? Well, yeah, Russell well, like, is in a band, isn't he? Like in, he, he, he started a band. as a musician, he has, I think. He has his own band, I think, and he writes songs and stuff. He, he did it. I think he did. He did a concert here after we, he got up with us. I think he, he might have even been promoting it. But um, yeah, like he was on the show. And the thing about that one was it was it wasn't planned at all. Like he just said, he just decided to get up on the stage and sing a song with us. So there again, nerves instantly. Oh my yeah. God, I don't even know. Um, there was no, nothing set up for him. So he basically took Paddy's mic and I think the keyboard player, Doc, tried to put a mic on his guitar. He's an acoustic guitar or something. Um, we were trapped up in this little balcony at that point. Uh, that's where our, sta- our stage was. So uh, I don't think he knew the show was live um, mm. because he just wanders up there, <laughs> starts setting up to sing a song and then gives out to the audience when they don't clap in time. Really? Um, nice. Yeah, well, he started giving out to them. Like He was like, if you're going to clap, he stopped the song. He said, if you're going to clap, clap in time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Irish people don't clap in time. <laughs> a lot of the time. Well, we always joke on the late, late. It's like Irish people also do the country music clap where it's one and one and three. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, and the late, late show clap is one and three. It's not two and four. So, um, you know, uh, but like, luckily he, he got up on stage and he's, uh, you know, he's, he just turns around and goes, blues and F. And I was like, thank God. Oh, so easy. <laughs> what was the song? Just a, ra- a random blues song, was it? Yeah, I, I think it was, you know, it was like, yeah, it was like uh, I heard that train come, what's it called, or Folsom City Brews or something like mm. that, or Folsom Brizzy, Brizzy Blues or something like that, um, luckily, and um, yeah, it was fine. But then the next time he came back, he brought a, he brought a guitar player and um, a piano player, singer, I think he was in Band Brothers, another actor, basically, and we kind of filled in the band around him and did a few, mm. few of his songs. Um, so that was, he's a real alpha male. He's mm. a good crack. Uh, That's a good like, one yeah, on the CD, though. Russ, yeah, you haven't crossed them. They have no. on the CV though. That's class, Russell Crowe. Like. That is, yeah. Well, they're the kind of things. Yeah, they they uh, they're the memories, aren't they? Mm. It's like uh, you know, and and like a lot of people. Like I remember she came in and um, they uh, they did the warm up and everything. So that they, because they're quite a you know it's a big band and to set them up. We were kind of set up behind them, and so you're. I was standing behind Jerry and uh, and the drummer. Um, uh, while they were playing, I was standing behind them, like, and it was mm. fantastic. I mean, it's just, that's a great band, and that that'd be my dream job now. I'll be honest with you, because Bernard Edwards is like he's my guy. Yeah, pick player as well, isn't he? He was always using a pick. I think was he Bernard Edwards? No, he had this chucking style. I think he used his finger like this, mm. and he just he used it like a pick. Um, I don't know how he did it. I, and actually, I tried looking it up because I was learning. Um, I remember trying to. I do. Um, you know, the beginning everybody dance. Um. That's that's got that sixteen note. Mm. Oh, he does yeah. it with his finger like a pick, but he doesn't use a pick. And um, I I just learned to do it finger style because it was a good exercise, um, and it's not quite the same. You kind of have to just put a dead note in where you can't kind of do it with the string crossing thing. Um, but I looked it up. And I tried looking it up on YouTube on how he did how how what the technique was he had, mm. and you can't really find it. Well, he couldn't back then a couple of years ago. He couldn't find somebody demonstrating it. Like you say again. You can't see it. It's so fast. Yeah, I think you're better off just learning how to use a plectrum. It's the kind of thing he probably just, yeah. he didn't want to learn how to use a plec and he started doing this and he got really good at it. But I think a quicker yes. route would just be learn plec- how mm-hmm. to use a plectrum probably. But it does, it sounds subtly different. He does it a, a lot actually. Probably. You are? It's a bit warmer probably than using a plectrum. Yeah, it's a bit warmer. And I think 
the, the problem with this, the plec is it's that it's that seventies octave thing. You have to cross over that middle string. You're jumping from well, I, I do it on the A string to the G string. Um, uh, so you're trying to cross over that D string, and with a plectrum, you might yeah, it's it's difficult. You're kind of like uh, it's like a bow, and you're trying to get a bow from the A to the G without hitting the D. It's like mm. it's, it's it's a it's an awkward technical thing. But um, he um, he, I was doing um, I'm coming out for a warm up there recently, and the the Jayan Ross song that he played on, and there's the the bridge section of that. He does it again. He does it. Like, he, he does this. Did it. Did it. And it's it's that technique definitely, and it's easy to do with a plec, I think. But mm. like that's the other thing, he made it hard for himself. Like, it's, <laughs> yeah, if you just like cut a would have been great on his finger. Jeez. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> what a bass player! Uh, I think I saw yeah. someone was at a documentary, and um, you know the the bass line that's been sampled a million times. The what, what's the she um, called? Oh, good times. Yeah. Good times. Yeah. When he wrote yeah. it, like I think he was just warming up in the stu- in the box, like. And the engineer was like, what, turned on, you know, the talk back mic. He said, what, what was that? What was that bass line? And he's like, I don't know, I'm just warming up. <laughs> it's just, and uh, yeah, like, like I, I, and it's also for everyone out there who's a bass player, the perfect sound check one, because it's kind of got that nice range in it. And it's, mm. it kind of, because uh, you can't, you can't really sound check with a bit, of, you, you know, with too much slapping or messing around. You're going to have, want to have something solid. I, I like, goes down from the low E up to that. Nice, yeah, um, you'll be the sound engineer's worst enemy if you're one of those people that's yeah playing like yeah. jazz or some crazy jacko lines or sound check yeah. and you end up yeah. just playing root notes all night like this <laughs> <laughs> which is what we do yeah it's what we do. <laughs> I, I have a sound check riff it's so basic but yeah sure, what else would you want it, it does it it pretty much covers have, all the sounds i'll use for tonight like we should have an instagram post of everyone's sound check uh, riff <laughs> i'd like to see <laughs> yeah. one i'll give you my one <laughs> yeah, I'll, do, I'll, do, I'll do one for, i'll do an instagram from the late late next week and uh of because of, 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 the great thing about a, a, a good bass riff for a sound check is usually the drummer joins in and it's a bit of crack mm. and <laughs> then you can do a bit of have a, I mean, if the sound if the sound one hasn't got it in the, in the first 45 seconds for a bass i think you're allowed to play some jack up bass <laughs> you know <laughs> if you have it in you or you have to want to uh, attempt something like that um because uh it's uh you know you've done your job <laughs> it's uh, a bass how yeah, loud is it do you want to put a compressor on it yeah how long does that take to set up you know yeah, just these boom, days boom, everything's boom. pre-saved as well so you know yeah i remember we were recording our last album and i don't know why i don't even play slap bass or barely anymore yeah but i kept doing this thing where i slapped the bass between takes and phil the engineer had to kind of he knows me well enough to be able to say as he said um my pet hate is when people slap the bass <laughs> <laughs> because it go, it puts it out of tune like because i was about to do it yeah. every time i'd go for before my takes i'd be slapping the bass and i was just like yeah you're actually right that's a ridic- stupid thing to be doing yeah. i'm just slapping the crap out of it even though there's no slap in any of our songs like yeah well it's just you know I'd, like going back to, to the craft there's something about slapping on a bass it's just it's just it draws you in yeah. you just want to you know you're a bass player somebody's gonna say to you just, just slap the bass there will you um and uh but no it's just so much fun isn't it yeah it is fun that's it Jay. it's it's enjoyable it the whole up, yeah it points up like and so unforgiving it just goes oh you're crap at this you better keep practicing that and then you end up <laughs> practicing it a lot for no like i'm lucky because what i would have in my job like I, I i remember once there was a play on i can't even remember who it was for it must have been for some a hairdresser or a barber or something because the, the play on was hair by larry graham i mean oh, nobody class. knows that song and it was at breakneck speed and like i was saying to the lads i said you're, you're a very lucky bunch that I actually know this because this is not the kind of thing you could just pick up today and say, I'll just play that. I'll just give me 30 seconds. I'll have this together. It was like, and yeah, it was like, you know, the original is like, really. but, do, but, but, do, do. they're going, do them, but, do, da, but, but, do, dip, dip, <laughs> do. no, it's like twice the speed. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, it probably sounded like a, a, I don't know what it sounded like, but uh, at least I had a heads up as in I had practiced it beforehand because it's one of those things you just kind of go, that's a cool line. I want to learn. That's probably most of the stuff we learn is like, it's a cool thing I heard on, like I have a yeah. playlist in Spotify and I just go, that's I, I, that's a nice one. I'll stick that in the playlist and get to that at some point, learn that. Uh, it, it's most of my practice routine, I'd say, is just learning things that other people have, you know, funk mm. tunes and stuff that go, that are, are nice little riffs that I've heard. Um, at this point, I mean, I do do, a little bit of practice, but you know yourself to keep the chops up. A bit, 
Well, have you learned? Uh, I know you didn't like you picked up the double bass. What in the last ten years is it? Um, last five years, really. Five years. Yeah, so, I, like, you yeah. must have put in a lot of hours in the yeah. shed to get to the level where you could play that, like, proficiently. Well, it's it's it's. Do I do I feel like I can play it proficiently? Um, I, I don't know. Ask any. It's like I, I compare it to um, my young fella playing the pipes. I think I've met a few pipers and some very very good ones over the years because of that. Um, and uh, I remember Davy Splan was in, and I'll get. Believe me, this is relevant. Davy Splan was in with Moving Hearts, and they were doing the late late, and uh, just before they went on, because uh, uh, my, our, my friend Ray, the drummer, is best friends with him and he knows him a long time he says yeah the, the pipes he hates the pipes like and that like that the, every every piper hates the pipe not not piping but they hate the way the pipes behave themselves all the time mm. they don't behave themselves and we moving hearts were in they did a great sound check just about to go on i could see davy splang kind of going jeez like this at the side of the stage they turned the air conditioning on so the thing was the whole room was freezing and, okay. and he just knew he hadn't played the pipes yet. he mm. just knew these are not going to be in tune because they've changed the atmosphere of the room um, and that's what it's like with the bass, you know, like with a double bass is very similar that way. It's, it's just so unforgiving again. Mm. And like, I, I'd say to myself, right, I made some progress and like I have, like it's been five years. I do kind of tend to practice for about an hour a day, at least I have kids and it's very hard, but I do that's put a the lot of practice, there. especially when you've got kids like, and you're saying you don't do any. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, it is a lot, I suppose, probably, but it's a lot for me. Um, and, uh, so I feel like I can, like I, I, I put together a quartet so I could do, you know, restaurant gigs drinks receptions and stuff so that i could practice that's real practice isn't it? as you probably know mm. any yeah. any musician knows that plays gigs you, you think you're doing what grand you go out in a gig and you realize right i've got a lot of stuff to do here this mm. is not happening um and so after about a year of kind of shedding the, the double bass i i i am um, and that's when i decided to get my reading together and everything as well um so it was a, i put a lot of a lot of stuff on my plate and uh i went out and did my first gig and i was like I can't tell if I'm in tune. I just can't tell with amplification and everything as well. It's like, mm. I, I, I have to change. My, is my pickup wrong? The strings, everything had to be reevaluated. <laughs> I was like, you know, and, I, and I, I, not, not least my own technique and everything. Mm. So I feel like I'm in a much better place than, than that. But um, it's, yeah, it's like, you look at people online, you just go, right, okay, I've got a lot of work to do. And, you know, I'm happy um, to be able to play tunes and yeah. to be able to play through standards and, you know, take, you know, the odd little solo maybe um, on the double bass and have a bit of crack with it. And, um, and like, you know, and I'm trying to do, I try to do things like I do, uh, we do dance monkey in the set and it's kind of, it's all this octave stuff and it's, it's not, it's not made for a double bass, but it's great fun. And like, I tried to kind of, yeah, like for what I needed to do, I'm, I'm, I feel confident enough now in it, but um, there's always more to be done. Like it's always, you know, and it's such a beautiful instrument as well. Yeah, but it I is, have, I'm playing a bit now, just with a, yeah. a two two lads who play country music, so it's like I've yeah. half the day between car changes. It's it's great. Yeah. That helps. It does help, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, like that's the thing. It's um, but like you say, even doing that, like you know, and you see people doing that, and they can just add in so much to that, um, mm. and and just by playing it live, I think playing it live it just brings you on as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I mean, I suppose most of my, I mean. If I was to if I was to give any advice in terms of playing, from my perspective, what, what I've learned most from is just playing with people that are much better than me all the time. Um, like um, Derek, our sax player, Der Derek O'Connor, is just like probably the finest musician I've ever seen. Um, mm. He's like he's world class and uh, on piano and saxophone. And so, and what I find was great about musicians, you, 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 so somebody like that who's really like he was, he was a uh, fully formed top class world class player at 17 like um whereas i was starting say he then. came out of the womb playing the saxophone or something. yeah well his dad's a saxophone player that, yeah like he's he from you and, and like you know he it, yeah it's it's like he did it all right as well he did he did the training and he did it but but that's not to take away from the fact he, like as he says himself he loves music and he's always like you know and he likes you know and there, there's a, a lad with a craft you know there's that's where the craft music is a craft that from that respect to be able to play like that you just have to put the hours in and um but playing with somebody like that, you know, if they play autumn leaves and, you know, they're not going to tell you what they're doing, you know, and they're just going to look over at you and, you, and just, you know, you're going, yeah, it's not really happening, is it? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> not happening tonight. That's, that's when you say to yourself, right, um, 
I'm not, I'm, I'm being outclassed. I got to get, you know, there's, there's an acceptable level here. We've got to get back into the uh, room and get to the acceptable level at least. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's too late when you're on the bandstand, isn't it? It's like, yeah, you're not going to, um, you, so, uh, you should have put in the hours, but you didn't. And you know, it. like, you're just, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, you, you know, you, with, with, with what I do, every gig is different. Like you don't know um, what the set's going to be. You know, if you're doing a wedding, you might get asked to do the drinks reception. So then you're going, okay, well, we're probably going to end up playing, you know, autumn leaves and blue bossa and stuff like this. And, you know, maybe I'll bring the double bass. Maybe I won't because it'll just, it'll just be easier. But um, you're going to be playing a six minute version of Girl from Ipanema. So, you know, um, and you might have to take a solo. So let's, let's start working on that now so that next year, <laughs> It'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, um, and I'm constantly, you know, and and you wouldn't be like that if you weren't doing those gigs, you know. Uh, from from my, for me, like I I wouldn't need to learn any of that stuff. I mean, I didn't grow up listening to jazz standards myself. Um, I love it now because mm. from from having to from listening to it, and like if I if I was to pick a, a gig to go in the morning on a sun tomorrow afternoon, if I wanted to go to a gig, I'd go to a jazz session if I could, you know, if there was mm. one on that I could get to. Um, and they're starting to come back, thank God. Um, uh, now, whether I'd be able to convince the wife to come with me, it'd be a different one, but, you know. <laughs> Sit through that. She, she could do the timing thing to keep herself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what time is this? I do that with the young lads. Sometimes. What time do you think this is? <laughs> but I think the listeners would be curious to hear how you actually got to where you are in the double bass, because you didn't get lessons yeah. right, did you? Did, like, no. Like, I, what I, resources I, um, I did, did you use? Like, I used the, um, I did use Discover Double Bass a lot. Um, I used, uh, I have the Samandel book. I'm about the third time going through it now. Um, that's hard work because yeah, it's people not, are so they're on the fence about that. Some people said it's say it's outdated. I have it here actually because I've been yeah. Afraid. This one is it? The first one, yeah. yeah. Yes, that's the one. It's well, it's like it's like anything. I mean, you know, this one I talk to young bass players a lot because uh, I run bands. Oh yeah, I haven't got that one actually. I must get into that. Read, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's the, that's the, another big one, isn't it? Um, uh yeah like uh, you know uh, it's like it's like anything it's what you what you what you put into you get out in in terms like i'm a perverse person like if if i decide to do something generally i just i'll hack away at it for you know like and like that's where this is where coming back to the love of something is again like i love the sound of the double bass Mm. and i love the sound of the electric bass and you know when it sounds like the record you go yeah now we're now we're cooking um and until it sounds like that, it's, you know, I, I just kind of bash away at it until I feel happy that I can do something. And when I got, I, I, I ordered a, a double bass from Toman. I, um, it was a mid, mid range thing, carved top, but uh, plywood sides. And, um, I, I said, right, I'm going to just, I had an old double bass before that, but it was like never set up right. And I, I, like, I didn't even know if it could play in tune, you know, that way I said, feck that I'll just get a decent new one that I know, um, that I can get, bring to a luthier and, and get set up. So I brought, I got it. The strings were ridiculously thick on it. Uh, the action was ridiculously high, even though you say to them, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to use it for pizzicato. I want to play it, use it for jazz mostly. And then I, I struggled with that for a while. Um, I, I look in a lot of videos, looking at the, um, and the Discover Double Bass thing is brilliant, especially the beginner's course, because all you need to know at the beginning is, how am I not going to cause myself an injury? Yeah. <laughs> you know? How do I, where does this hand go now? And I like, you're probably like me and anyone who learns anything to, that's another thing, great thing about the craft of music. It teaches so much about yourself, but I need to know exactly where this elbow goes. And then, and then you just, you, and, and it says, everybody tells you, look in the mirror when you're practicing all that. And you look in the mirror and go, Jesus, none of it looks right. It's like, it's, it's a disaster. It's a very physical instrument and you have to play it properly. Like you can double on not electric bass. You can kind of invent your own technique and you'll get yeah. away with it. But I don't think you yeah. get away with it on the double bass. Like. No, you won't. And, uh, and like, that's not to say that it's impossible. It, it's just, it means that for the first, I'd say six months for me, I felt like, um, I felt like, Every time I did this, it hurt, you know, that way a little bit mm. uh, like, and I know from playing the electric that it should, nothing should hurt. Nothing should feel uncomfortable, you know? Um, and it just took like, even that spacing, that spacing there with the three, you know, between one, two and four. Yeah, I was having good crack in the pub the last day. A young fellow was playing the cajon and he wanted to learn how to play double bass. So I said, yeah, I'll give you yeah. a lesson. And I was like, see your ring finger forget about it. And he's like, what, what's my ring finger? I said, oh, you're too young for <laughs> get lost. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's like I understand now why people talk about golf swings. You know, it's mm. it's the same thing. Um, and you look at other double bass players, and you just go, "Oh, that's lovely." <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect <laughs> form. You know, you look at a. Uh, you know, and then you look at other people going, geez, how is he making that sound so good? Everything's all over the place. You know, like I'm, but I'm one of those people that uh, I do like to, um, to uh, learn how to do it right first. And then, then, you know, I'll fall into the usual bad habits or invent my own way of doing it if I, if I have to. Um, and that's not to say I've learned how to do it right, but it definitely doesn't, hurt. it doesn't after when I changed, I, I like it, I, I wouldn't advise anyone to do it the way I did it. Really. I'd advise you to go to somebody and say, um, uh, just even get a couple of lessons and say, um, like, what am I, what can I do here to make this easier for me? Because I, I should have changed the strings immediately. I should never have waited to get new strings. Uh, they were like classical bow. They were suited for bowing. They were too heavy. They were just, they're going to kill my right hand and my left hand to hold them down. Um, so I got new, I, I've gone through a couple of different sets of strings, but get lighter strings. Like I, I found this in the electric. I don't know how you feel about it, Stephen, but on the electric, you know, the standard standard gauge on electric bass is 45 to 105, I think, is it, or 100? Mm. I, I, I just go a little bit lower than that, and I find it just, it doesn't make any difference to the sound and it makes it much easier to play. And it's uh, much better for things like slap and stuff and the brightness. The genre for me, I, for the, the band, the rock band, I use 90 to 110. Yeah. Like yeah. big, wow. thick one, extra thick ones. That's very thick, yeah. Um, and I, But I'm a 40 to 95 guy, if I can. Um, and... Uh, I mean, I spent years playing the standard gauge and, 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 you know, it's, you can play away and it's like some people say, you know, it makes you play less and it's better, you know, but I just find like, I, the other thing that I mean, my job, I have to be versatile. I have to be able to do slap one minute, make it sound like a precision with flats and a pick and another using my nail and rolling off the tone. Mm. Um, and, you know, and then just play finger style most of the night, like most everybody else, um, um, and this, and and the double bass, it's like just make it easy on yourself. I brought it to a luthier. He brought the bridge down. He brought the action down. I'm going to bring it to him again now because I think the fingerboard needs to be leveled a bit more. Um, and uh, I got new strings, and that just changed everything. I mean, ma- made every uh, so much. Uh, I haven't changed my, anything on mine since I bought it off Toman, and the strings are absolutely massive on it. So maybe I should, I should get like new. Oh, a hundred percent. There's, there's, if I was to tell you, like I'm using Spiral Chords at the moment with, um, and there's, there's even ones I had, I, I put on the guts, the plastic gut um, ones, um, just to try them. So easy to play, made it easier to play, but, um, very hard to, t- your tuning is, it's very hard to hear the tuning. That was the thing for me. And you can't really bow them, the ones I got. Um, and, uh, I only really use the bow for practicing for intonation and stuff like that, but like, let's face it, it's all about intonation. So yeah. that kind of, I got rid of them. Um, and I'm not going to be playing slap, you know, the, the weed whackers or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be doing that in any of the gigs I do. So, so I got Spiral Chords and there's this company called Blast Cult who do a very, very light steel string. And, um, I put them on the D and G, um, because my action isn't great on that bass. And I said, um, and while they're not as loud as a spiral chords, they're just slightly little. I'm usually, you know, you were probably like me. If you're even playing with the country band, you, you probably have to use a pickup and go into an amp. Uh, no, we're just all playing acoustic in the pub. It, we're Great, like, even we're better. This tiny bar and there's no amplification at all. Like so. And but, is and obviously your bass has enough power out of it and everything, so well, you're it's happy. It's plenty loud. Like it's well, then fully it's a good acoustic bass, session, and it's there's not a lot of people in the pub. It's only a jam session once a month Brilliant. we're doing for the crack. Like. Well, I'd say just get yourself a set of spire cords or something light, uh, lighter, like the Vikes, and um, and see how you go. Because it won't make any difference really to the volume, in my experience. Um, the very, very light ones are, are quieter, like the ones I have in the D&G. But I'm usually amplifying it, so it doesn't make any difference. Oh, I mean, what are you looking at? About 100 euros is it for a set of them? They're, they last for life pretty course. much once you get them. Like, but. I think spire cords about 150. I could be wrong. They're the cheaper end of strings. That's some, some investment in strings, but I know you have it to is. do it. Like. Well, I think... Like I was talking to a, a really fine bass player, um, Dan Bodwell, there before the pandemic. She's so long since I've even met another bass player. Sorry. And uh, it's your first he, time uh, meeting a bass player in two years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is great t- chatting to you, Stephen. Um, and he was playing Spire Chords. And I said to him, You're playing Spire Chords. Yeah. He says, um, And because I, I, like even two years ago, I was like, I was like, This guy is like, he's, he's a monster, a great bass player. Um, and he was saying, um, Yeah, I tried loads of different ones. I was in going back to these. And I said, Yeah, you know, loads of people say that. So start there. That's the place to start, mm-hmm. I think. I should have started there myself, like I said to you. And there was, I had a set once on my old bass called the Jazzard. I, think, I can't remember, Perastro make them. And they are so light and flexible, it's beautiful to play them. And I think 
you're not going to play it if it's hard. And no instrument should be too hard. I mean, it's pizzicato, so that's why the strings have to be lighter, you know. Um, and then, you know, like when you, when, as an electric player, you can feel that. You get those two fingers in and you can almost feel like, I can get 16th out of this. This is great, you know. It really makes it fun, you know. Um, and, and then you're not, you're not going to end up in the, getting um, physiotherapy. <laughs> yeah I, I have to do something of mine it's absolute but i kind of get a laugh out of it as well when everyone wants to play it when i bring it out and then yeah. the action is insane and the strings yeah. are insane and like no one yeah. can get even a, a note out of it i'm like <laughs> yeah you know it took a lot of work to get good on this thing but not really it's just a, it's it's a beast of a well thing. maybe you're right Stephen. maybe you should start like that because it gets all your strength up and everything you know yeah um, and it is about arm weight, as they say, you can, but you can talk about arm weight and all this stuff all you like for, you know, until you actually get it yourself, you don't understand it. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, you just oh, this is easy. Yeah, but mm. it takes six months. You know? <laughs> I heard a, a podcast with your man that plays with Robbie Williams talking about how when Robbie Williams did a swing album. Um, he said to your man, um, so you played a double bass, don't you? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going out on tour in two weeks. Oh, yeah, grand, yeah. He, he'd never played it before in his life. <laughs> and I think he did end up in physio because of it. Because he, really? he had to learn in two weeks. Oh, you Jesus, know? yeah. But uh, in fairness, that's the kind of attitude that you, you, you probably should have that attitude. Oh, yeah, I'm going to learn this. Just do it. I'd recommend it to anyone to get one if you have the space. Like, and Yeah. I, I, yeah. My one wasn't expe- crazy expensive. Like, no more no. than like uh, an electric base you'd buy. Like, Yeah, like mine. I, I, I think I spent 1500 on in mine. Mm. Um, and I'm out gigging with it the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, and I like, I, as I said, the pickup is for what, for most people, you have to have a, a pickup and, you know, you will, you mightn't have it, like generally I wouldn't have it up too loud. Like it's just a little bit of extra oomph in a room um, so that you're playing acoustic because it's usually quiet in your, like I have a magnetic on it now as well because I had to do a couple of weddings and I realized there's no point trying with a piezo. It's just pointless. It's just, mm-hmm. it's feedback yeah, they're, they're very hard to get a sound out of. You just get complete yeah. like low in coming up feedback totally it's a disaster and and uh yeah so i got a magnetic pickup and you know you say to yourself jesus it sounds like an electric bass now so what's the point and you go it looks cool <laughs> and also you can really hear your intonation on the magnetic pickup mm. it's great for um and some of great players play with play with magnetic pickups um it, it doesn't sound particularly double bassy but when you're playing loud all people want to hear is those fundamental low notes and yeah. you know um, and you just don't want to hear feedback. So get, you know, that's, that, you know, I, I, I said to myself after I got it and I played my first wedding with it, I went, why did I just hold off buying that for so long? Now I have two bloody pickups in the damn thing. Mm. Okay. It, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, it's a bit messy, but you know, make it, just, you know, it does the job and that's the thing. Um, like that's the other thing. Like I, I only, have, you know, going through like, look, I'm not a big gear head, but you kind of, it's good to know the stuff that works. And if you can ask somebody that uses, like I said, spiral cores, you know, a magnetic pickup if you're playing really loud. Um, go bring it to, the first thing you should do is bring it to a luthier. That's yeah, find there's a guy, there's guy in Galway, is it? That's where everyone goes to. There's a guy in Dublin as well that I went to, uh, James Beatley there in Stony Batter. He's, he's, uh, he's got a workshop there. He works on all string instruments. But um, mm. yeah, like I brought it into him. And I emailed him, brought it in. It was done in an hour and he's st- stand beside me. Like it, I, I didn't have to leave it there even, you know, just to get the bridge done to the right heights yeah. and everything. And it just made like between that and the strings, it just made everything so much um, easier. Like it's life changing, Stephen. Do it. God, I need to start it out. <laughs> just, I, my shed is a bit cold, and I, I I'm just afraid of buying an expensive double bass, and then I yeah, think well, happened to Jaco Pastorius when it, yeah. I read his book, and um, he lived when he was living in Florida. The humidity was crazy, and he yeah. literally just came home one day. And the base was completely on the ground in different parts. All the wood had set, all the glue had separated from the humidity, and the base was just on the ground, completely disassembled and just fucked. Like, oh no! Like, Ireland is a good country for storing instruments. I think generally we wouldn't, yeah. be too high humidity. Like, you're not going to get seams busting too often. I'd say no. And and like you, like like I said, mine is a carved top, but it's, it's plywood. The rest of it, and I think they're better for that as well. Um, um, there's no. I mean, look, at some point, I'd love to get a fine instrument and, you know, with loads of projection and stuff. But again, I mean, I am amplifying it most of the time for the work. Mm. And so, and I'm not a classical player. Um, uh, so, like, it's not like I need to have a big resonant instrument that, you know, will fill a room with bass. Um, I have a little amplifier to do that. And, yeah. you know, so really the action is really important. Um, I'm feeling comfortable on to enjoy it, I think. Uh, and uh, And then after that, then you say to yourself, well, anything else? You know, any of the crap sounds coming out with now are my fault. 
mm. and not the you know the strings or the the action or the fingerboard. It's it's my fault, and that's 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 my attitude. I always re- try to remember that when I look and I'm looking at fine basses, lovely basses on the li- online, old vintage instruments and things that you go, oh, geez, I love that now, that'd be brilliant. And I go, so, yeah, but I'm still going to be crap playing it. I need to, you know, I may as well just get me stingray out and practice, you know. Yeah, I, no, I yeah, it's very, that. it's hard to not buy stuff, isn't it? You really have to be strong sometimes if you see a deal. Like... You. Well, well, what it takes as well sometimes in my experience is you buy something and get disappointed. And you go, yeah. well, that didn't change my life, you know. Mm. Um I tell you one thing that that I really enjoyed in the last during the pandemic. Oh, I actually I was going to ask you about I got this, a yeah. Coleman base. Yeah, like yeah, a, a kit, and I decor I I I spray painted it. It's aerosol, like, um, and put it together myself. Put some flats on it. I don't I don't actually have a Fender Precision, so I said mm. to myself, you know, um, and I it was just a, it was a project, you know. Yeah. I put the nice vintage. Uh, color on the thing, put my name on it and everything. How did and, you? Uh, oh, you made the little the label. Uh, yeah, printed out, stuck it on. I I, I ordered it from England. Oh, but yeah, it, <laughs> achieved. Class. Yeah, and it was it, a car was, paint to use, was it? As the color, I I got the nitro from um. There's a there's e a, there's a company in England that has them. You can get them all. You can get them in Ireland. There's, there's a fellow I know in Ireland who sells a nitro, um, from a guitar company like um, and mm. it's like, I think the one can. They're like seventeen quid the cans and. Mm. That and the and the clear coat. I should have got the primer, but just you live and learn. Um, it's 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 already like because it's nitro. There's little chinks coming out of it, and it's like starting to get like I'm not going to relic it. It's mm. just going to get relicked. Yeah, know, yeah. I I've done loads of project bases. Just few yeah. ones on the wall. Like you know, I, I like it. It's just fun. But you're living in Dublin. Yeah. It must be hard. Like I have a, I can keep the dust in a different shade here if I want. Like, but how did you manage I, to not I, destroy the entire house? Like while you were standing down know. this, I am. Um, yeah, it's like I have this room. This is my this is my palace, and uh, yeah, we had a concrete floor at the time, so I've done some carpet tiles now. So I probably wouldn't sand it in here now. But yeah, it was it, 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 that was fun, and that was like getting the gear out of like it was a hundred euro the bloody thing. So it was mm. fantastic. Like and like it is a bit of a neck diver, and the body's a bit too light. And but like for instance, I was doing that James Bond thing. And, and, you know, diamonds are forever. It's precision with flats and the damping and it's got that like, this little little hook on a, a base by itself. And I was going, I'm so glad I, bu- I built that base. Now I can use it. I don't have to like borrow somebody else's precision. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't spend money on bases really. I spend... You don't have a lot of bases. Like what do you have? No. A jazz, uh, a stingray. The stingray is the one I play all the time. And it's, and it's the only really... Um, that's a, it's a 1980. It's a, it's really, that's real relicking. So, um, <laughs> it's got like, a lot of like when Louis Johnson used to play Lewis Johnson, is it? I think yeah, he used that color, that finish. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, I got this, I got it off, uh, I think, I think Tony Malloy owned it, owned it at one point, but, uh, uh, it's, it's an old one. So, um, uh, I got it off Pete Fagan, but he, uh, well, I, pl- I got up one night. It, it was it, it was a, a there was a gig on, and I got up on a Monday night and just jammed a couple of songs. And they happened. Your man happened to have that bass, and I was playing. I going, this bass sounds brilliant. Um, and then about a year later, he was selling it, and because I happened to say, I just said to him, "She said bass is great," and uh, he uh, uh, and I got it off him. So uh, and I played it. I've had it since about two thousand and six, I'd say, and I'd say ninety percent of the time it's the only bass I play. Um, uh, I use like a, I have a five string, uh, a, G, a GNL five string, and that's mm. great. That's a great player. I have the it's same bass, but uh, the four string version of it. Oh yeah, I saw it on the wall there. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a fantastic bass. Again, thank you, Leo Fender. And then I have a Sandberg pres- uh, jazz bass and an old Squire jazz bass, my first proper bass, and nothing else really of note i don't think so nothing expensive apart from the stingray probably be worth a few quid if i was to sell it um but like every time i say to me i'm leaving the house to go to the late late or something i say i look at the rack and i go what will i bring and i go you fool just bring the stingray don't be an idiot you know because anytime i've done it i've like i remember one time doing a country music special and i brought the five string because it's country music and often they need that low d and i don't play the five string enough often enough to be kind of going I'm a super, super confident on you know, that kind of way. I only got it about two years ago. And, yeah, and it's I had very f- confusing when you're not used to it. It's just that little brain, if you have a little brain fart mm. and you end up on the wrong string, it's a disaster. And uh, for the whole show, I was, I mean, there's loads of live music and, and the bass sounded great. And I was going, for the whole show, there was that little 
stress needle they're back on. Don't hit the wrong string. You need you. Why did you bring this bass? You should have brought the stinger. You know, yeah, you don't really need the low D on this gig. I they play in drop D a lot, actually, when I'm in the band to get the, yeah. the lowest. Not if, if a song is in standard tuning on the guitar, I'll play in drop yeah. D so I can go down low. But yeah, that's a, but that's another that's another craft. That I you know I. At one point, I think I could do that, but I don't think I could do it. You know, if I was to do it right now, I'd, be, I'd get confused and, and hitting G's instead of A's and or A's <laughs> instead of G's and stuff. So, um, um, yeah, I try and I, I suppose that's the television thing, though. It's like just keep it simple because there's a lot of other things to worry about. The last thing you need to be worrying about is, you know, like I don't even use um, I don't use a pedal. I use a tuner. That's it. Um, uh, I have a little zoom thing if I needed something like a, a synthy sound or something like mm. that. I have a little zoom thing I can turn on. Um, it was like it's 65 euro or something, a uh, digital thing. And you're fairly you frugal. Know, you're like, you don't be blowing the wad and all these, all the gear unless well, you have to. I think I learned it. I, I just learned that it isn't worth it. Like, you know, mm. and then now, and, and like, look, I'm, I'm a professional in terms, of it's my living. So I can write things off and, you know, I should really, you know, but like, I, I suppose for myself, I just learned that like I, I can spend money on a nice interface here and, you know, have a good setup in the studio. I probably spent more money on studio equipment over the years, uh, over the last 10 years than I did on bass equipment. And it vacillates, you know, sometimes I'll have a little, I'll spend a few quid on this and that. Um, but it's the studio or some bass or, you know, I have a, like the only bass pedal I really use on gigs is the fly rig, the Sans Am fly rig thing because it covers a lot of different things and it's really small and it's and and it sounds good and um i love the uh the filter wow on it if i have to break out and do something it's just like gives it a bit of a it's a bit of a head turner um but like that bass the the, the thing about the stingray as well and in, in my job you need something that's clean and quiet as hell because you don't want a sound man in, in television going oh, i need to gate that uh, there's there's just a it's a single coil homer and you can't have that really mm. so the old vintage and jazz bases or whatever probably wouldn't cut it for for that gig um just for that reason it's 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 you just don't want the hassle of somebody saying a sound man going um it's a bit of a there's a bit of a 60 cycle home or there's a bit of you know it's not grounded right or and that that thing is like a tank it just doesn't make sound it it's very rare that a light would even interfere with that humbucker mm. um and uh and i just yeah i keep it simple um also when i plug that bass straight into a mixing desk it sounds that's the best it sounds you know that way some bases sound great going through an ampeg with a bit of some valves and an eight by ten cab and and that bass doesn't sound good doing that for some reason yeah. to me um, that's great for a jazz bass or precision bass, but not a stingray. And uh, I've been on gigs where there's an Ampeg 4x10 and the, the tube, lovely tube head. And I go to myself, oh, bollocks, I should have brought the jazz bass because the stingray is going to sound, it just loses its bottle in it. Um, mm. Too the, uh, or bit of treble or something too much when you have yeah, the amp. Like. You lose the treble with the Ampeg anyway. And the stingray is like a lot of treble on it. And then the bottom end, there's a lot of bottom end on the Ampeg. And the bit, stingray has a lot of bottom end already. So and the mid range then just kind of lost. So it just doesn't, the great thing about a stingray on a gig is uh, it's versatile because you just roll a tone off or, you know, it, it's surprisingly versatile and also it just cuts through with a drummer. It's just, that's why I love it. Um, you can get that sound with these active, with new active basses, jazz basses and these, these fancy basses. Yeah, of course. But um, yeah, look, it's just, I'm a simple man. I'm from the country like yourself, yeah. Stephen. I know, from the farm. Yeah. That's it. You never thought of coming up, becoming a farmer, or you never thought you'd take up the the family business. No, that was the thing. Like going back to what I was saying in the beginning, like you know, I was I was a fish out of water in that world. You know. Yeah, me um, too. I was just. Uh, where you? Yeah. I do the jobs, like no bother, like. But yeah, I just wanted to be yeah. inside. I was inside playing computer games most of the rest. Of yeah, time. yeah. I had a Commodore sixty four in the eighties. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I was yeah, I was I was happy. It's the same thing that worked against me after I left college, that solitary thing, working away, drawing at my table or whatever. I was happy doing that when I was a kid and a teenager. But then when I got older, I wanted to have that. Yeah. And uh, now on the farm, the farm was great for teaching a, a lot of, you're, you become a, pra- a much more practical person. Now, mm. everyone home at the farm would say that I'm the least practical person they've ever met, but compared to city folk. <laughs> yeah. And the hard work like, gets instilled in you. Like you just, yeah, it's so, yeah you feel uncomfortable it's not it's more normal to be driving having a goal and working hard at it like i think that gets yeah. instilled in you like definitely and and i and like i have three brothers like there was four of us every one of us is self-employed and i think that's a farming thing too um mm. and 
if you're a musician, I think it's great to have, you have to think of yourself as being self-employed, even if you're working with a band or whatever, Definitely. like you really are, you need to have that attitude because it's, there's, there's a, it's not an easy, it's not an easy business. Um, you, you could argue there's not very many easy businesses left, but music is not um, the kind of thing that you should, you know, it doesn't suit everybody in, in, from a business point of view. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, you do definitely need to be, uh, you know, be able to stand on your own two feet with it. So that, that the farming thing is definitely given that to me, I think, um, mm. uh, mucking out sheds. You never want to go back to that, says you. No, it's not great crack or looking <laughs> after she cleaning sheep's hooves and all this kind of stuff. No. Oh, no, no. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, dipping sheep. That's not fun. Yeah. No, sheep dog we used to do that, right? Everything. The father used to throw the dog into the dip then. That'd be his, yeah, his wash for the year. Like. Oh, the poor dog. And he wouldn't talk to you for two days. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, it's true. I always just say to people, they, or they talk about the musician thing. I just say that I'm just self-employed like everyone else. Like I yeah. have friends yeah. who are builders and all kinds of jobs. Yeah. I said, it's just yeah. the same as, well, it's not the same. Uh, it's a bit different, but really in reality, the amount of work is the same. You don't ever get well, a day off. Know, I mean, I'm sure you have friends who are electricians or, or farmers, mm -hmm. but like the other thing about, say, a farming background, farmers love their job, you know, yeah. like if, there's no point in being a farmer if you don't like it because no. it's yeah. not, it's relentless. It's just, it's like being a musician. It's relentless. It's a vocation. And, you know, and, and it's the same with music. If you don't like going back to what what we've said again, time and time again, talking here, you know, if you, from my perspective, any of the people that I know that are musicians that love it, that makes their life easy. It's if you're sitting there going, what am I doing with my life? Oh God, I wish I was doing something else. It's time, you know, it might be time to get out of it because, yeah, you know, you're going to suffer. It's not, it's not a good place to be in this job, to be uh, worried about um, wringing your hands about what, what career choices you've made, really. You kind of have to go with the flow. Um, and the other thing I'd say to young, to other people, um, something I learned in the, in, during the pandemic is just because you're a musician doesn't mean you can't diversify and do other things as well as mm -hmm. like, you know, I mean, I found myself doing all sorts. I've, I like, I'm not like yourself, Stephen, probably I'm slightly different in that. Like most of my work, like I said, is events and functions and things. And apart from the t television and, um, but like I found myself booking gigs and managing bands yes. and, you know, uh, and getting involved in all that stuff. And I have even like, and I do all the promotion material for the bands and stuff. Um, and the art school background might help with that. But like, I love all of that as well. It's like, you know, it, it goes back to playing to an audience. It's like, if, if I just, it, it's, that's the challenge. It's like, can you make people enjoy what you do? That's mm. kind of the only challenge. If you can do that, then all the numbers start adding up. It's like, then people come to see the show, then people pay you then. But if people don't like what you do, um, then, you know, you're, you you made it's time to get a job. Um, yeah, a real well, you, one. you do a lot of like cover bands and kind of you use what you've yeah. learned over the years to run your own bands. It was like yeah, like bands and all kinds of things like all you know. sorts. I started out in doing tribute bands in the nineties. That's where I first got my my well good paying gigs, and and they were uh, you know and uh, and you know when you're we, there was a band we set up a disco band in the nineties and we were playing. Um, we ended up playing like midnight at Olympia, like six months for six months on a Saturday night. And there's nothing like 1500 people going mental in front of you every Saturday night and then getting That's well paid. For it. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Oh God, I went, I'd love that they brought that back. Um, but it's like, it's like you feel like you're, you know, it's, it's probably the same feeling Ed Sheeran gets, you know what I mean? You've mm. got a big side fill pumping the music out. You're now you're, you know, all the, all the hard work's taken away because you're playing the best music you know, some of the best music ever made. Because if you're not playing the best music, people aren't going to be dancing to like the way mm -hmm. losing their minds to it. Um, and as a bass player, playing, like I said before about the Abbott thing, playing some of the best bass oh, parts. bass lines, like. You know, and the, all the disco stuff. My God, that was so much fun. Um, and still is uh, when I play it on uh, a wedding. Like, and then just seeing 1,500 people going mad, you know, and uh, and knowing that you've got them, you know. Um, and, and like from then, from there, like the other thing about it is like, uh, I wouldn't call myself, I'm not a chop space player. I'm not a, um, I'm not a really, like I'm self-taught, so I'm not studied. I never, never learned from, I never even got a lesson from anyone really, apart from getting my ass kicked by piano players and, you know, uh, and drummers and, you know, drummers saying to you, you know, you know, you're, you're ahead there. Or you should, you should lay back more or something when you're a young lad, you know, listen to that. Cause that's the kind of thing, you, that's the kind of thing that makes you, I remember Ray Brown saying in the master class, I get, I get paid to go, boom, boom, boom. I don't get paid for the fancy solo stuff. I, exactly. I, it's called sound and time feel. Mm. That's it. Um, and like, so I'm happy if people think that I sound good, you know, that kind of way and fits in with the band. I'm not, I'm not a, 
but from that then I the the way that I've and because I get my ass kicked in the bandstand I learned how to what I learned about harmony and I learned how to play a rudimentary piano can't I have no chops at all but it, you know I can work out things and, and like so I learned how to arrange stuff how to break songs down and stuff I do that all the time obviously for my job and uh so that that allowed me to put to md bands basically and and you know put tracks together and teach people their parts and and uh you know it's it's that's another that's a diversification that's the kind of thing like i'm like i said yeah i'm not a chops bass player i'm not the number one call here's the session bass player in ireland there are no sessions left anyway so there's no yeah, point exactly. being, yeah. i couldn't Pete even think who would be the number one call for chops bass players in ireland well, there, yeah, there you go and 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 like and people like Keith Duffy and Tony Malloy and all these fantastic bass players that they're maybe a little bit older than me. Um, uh, I was, I, I was lucky enough to be in a studio recently and Keith Duffy was playing the bass. I was going, I love your job. Your job is great. <laughs> He's a great bass player. And he gets great gigs as well. Doesn't he doing cool music? Yeah. Like, yeah, he gets he gets the the Westlife tours and the, the and and rightly so. I mean, he's that's 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 his that's the other thing about being self employed. Everyone finds their own little niche, and my niche is like what my niche is, and uh, you know, um, and uh, and Keith's fantastic, and that's the thing. But like he'd say himself, he's not one of these guys taking mad solos and no. and doing slapping and tapping. He's playing a Fender Precision with flats and making it sound as as in the pocket as he can and. I mean, he's he's got great chops, Keith. It's like it's not like he can't play any of that stuff. It just doesn't, you know. Uh, it's called taste, I suppose, and uh, and he gets hired for his sound and his feel. Um, and he's a great guy. And that's the other thing about bass players. A lot, of, I, I know a good few bass players at this point. Most of them are great, great people, you know. Yeah. Girls and guys now. It's great to see lots of girls playing bass as well. Um, well, more girls playing bass than they used to be probably when I was coming up. And um, and so like and. You know, I, I love music, so learning more about music, I'll always be doing that. And, uh, and, and, and I love, you know, working with, you know, right now, it might be right now, chord charts or doing backing tracks or, you know, um, uh, teaching vocal parts to, for harmonies to things. And, you know, it's like all, that's all music. And like, I, I heard, I was listening to your thing with Jeff Berlin and I think Jeff talks a lot of sense when he talks about music mm -hmm. and bass players kind of get lost in the bass a bit because because it's a weird instrument. Like, like I was going back to what we were saying at the beginning, like, why did you love the bass? Why do I love the bass? I couldn't tell you. It's something about gravity. You gravitate towards it. It's like, you know, there's, there's no reason for it because it's not the one. It doesn't get you the glory. Nobody knows what it is. You yeah. know, <laughs> um, only other musicians appreciate it really, you know, mm. um, unless you do this, this, the slap solo, maybe at some point you might go, oh, that sounds like flea, you know, that's great. You know, mm. but, um, you know, so, um, so like, and a lot of bass players are great at, at, um, at, at doing arrangements and stuff because they, they see their, they, 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 they're big thinkers, they're whole thinkers because they, they, they see themselves as part of a whole and, and yeah, you understanding that whole. everyone, don't you? You have to listen to the, the whole, because yeah. a lot of bass players become the MD, don't they? That I've noticed they do, that. Don't they? I've had a few yeah. guests on, had Owen O'Neill, who was yeah. MD of Riverdance for about 10 years, like, and yeah. Like they're they're big yeah. and who else was on? Um, Paul Bushnell isn't he the commitments MD? Wasn't he? He was MD for commitments and a few other gigs. And uh, Joe yeah. was on, who's uh, MD for um, big pop act at the moment. Loads of them. It's it's it yeah. definitely suits the bass player, doesn't it, to be an MD in a band like the person. Yeah, and I would all, I would say to any bass player, you know, if you got your if you if feel like your 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 bass playing is going well. You know, get into the piano or get into the guitar. You definitely. Well, first of all, I think every bass player should be at least be able to play one of those other instruments, mm. well, harmonic instruments, to a certain level. You know, like I'm I'm a brutal guitar player, but like you know, I can play all the chords. You yeah. know, kind of. Same here. I can. Uh, I'm good at teaching guitar, and I can play it at home, but I'll yeah. never play it in public ever again. <laughs> Just yeah. I've got bass fingers, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is it. But, but like, if you didn't play the guitar, like if I didn't play the guitar, and I have to break down a song, you know. In, in, like I might have five songs to break down before I go into the late late and I'm not one of these people who writes out I'm not going to write out the bass part and I'm certainly not going to just work work out the bass part and go that's grand you know you kind of go I want to know what the harmony is so you listen to it and you go well I think it's this and I just double check it here grand and you want to know you know that's a major not a minor that's a you know you want to hear where the difficult bits are um I mean, it goes back to doing standards as well. That's great. That's a great thing with, you know, you're, you can't, you can't get away to anything if you're trying to walk a bass line. So um, you kind of, you need to know the whole chord. You need to know, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, a seven with a flat 13 or whatever it is. You kind of need to know. And, and like, I'm still 
to believe me, I don't have it all sorted out, but I'm work, I, something I'm constantly working on is trying to um, understand more about music because there's so much to learn. Yeah, um, it's amazing at the um, moment, though, with like Rick Beato and all these people online. Yeah. Like I've learned yeah. so much in the last four years about music theory that I had yeah. no clue of before. It's just it, all this YouTube stuff is just amazing for Yeah, and it's, it's, it's like, fun, isn't it? It's fun to, um, you know... Uh, Okay, it's a rabbit hole you could go down and get obsessed by and to no to no end but um if you're applying it back to what you're doing then it's it's you know it's always going to be good for you and like i always say like if you don't it's like me learning the double bass go back to learning it properly i mean if if you were to, to break it down on a practical level i mean every time it's not like i'm going to earn mega bucks more because i played a double bass now it's nice to be able to play both and you know you do get the odd call i do get the odd gig where i'm playing both um but like on paper, sticking with the electric bass, I'll, I'll probably just do is fine. But I wanted to learn it and it's just, it's fun. And I always find that if you do, if you do put the work into something, it usually pays off in ways you'll never guess in the future. It's not when we did our first comedy album, you know, uh, with the Canberra Quartet, like we were doing, you know, Latin versions of Stairway to Heaven. Did, I didn't realize we get a television show out. You know what I mean? Um, and that's, that's more or less exactly what happened. You know, you, we, we did something like I recorded and, and there and we 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 self produced and and about we probably sold about a thousand of them at college gigs you know uh, the type of gig you saw in in yeah. that in in uh, in Clonmel there like it was that that kind of crack but we would we would do Stairway to Heaven in a Latin version you probably we probably played it that day to you but we would have done lots of other stuff and when we put that album together it was like there's no way anyone's going to buy it you know but it's a bit of crack and then Brian Tobri started playing it on the radio and getting us well, out of the I will say though well, I was a bit depressed at that time because I was in the factory and I wasn't I didn't have a band right and, but I yeah. was impressed by the by the whole band like your level of musicianship yeah. was well they're great was, players aren't they all you were them. like a level above like the average pub co- you were above a cover band you see in a pub generally like I could tell well that was the you thing were all a that bit, was the art you know, school thing mm-hmm. yeah it was like we can't just we're not going to play Mr. Brightside and you know, as the record, you know, well, we can do that and, and we'll do that at a wedding. But, you know, but, you know, when we're doing that type of a gig, there's certain gigs where you can just do whatever you want and have the crack. And it, that that scenario is perfect. And we did so many gigs like that where it's like you say, it's a lot of factory workers or people working in a company that they're, you know, they're, they're, they're doing their job and it's fine. But like it's a lunchtime gig. I mean, are you going to sit really going to you're going you're gonna, to you're not going to rock out, are you? You're not going to no, sit there no. rocking out. You're not going to be you don't want to you don't want to hear like um, po face steely dan covers you, you know it has to have the you have to have the crack and mm. um that's what we designed the thing it just came out of us naturally that way myself and paddy when we got together doing things and then when we added in like me and paddy would would be the first to say um at the beginning that we were the worst musicians in the band we, we got like the best piano player sax player we got the best drummer we could find but what, what i think what the and uh what the other guys in the band realized is that with a bit of crack their musicianship was allowed to shine with all we did was add a bit of crack into it and mm. and come up with some fresh ideas to do it to do with playing covers let's say and, and you have to have that personality like uh, you know the type of front man that can he- could get back at a heckler and beat the heckler every time you know and uh i mean we used to get bottled off for doing Jimi hendrix covers in latin style and we did everything in a latin style it was like <laughs> that's your people, go-to like people, usually it's yeah. like you know they do um uh, a pop song sad version yeah. or they'll do yeah. a happy version of a of a sad song you just do a latin version of everything yeah we used to just and, and like you know somebody would be a big fan of Jimi hendrix who'd come up to you at, at the side and say you stop playing that i'm gonna, I'm gonna kick your ass you know <laughs> <laughs> and like okay people aren't as it's a bit it's it, 20 years later people aren't as uh precious let's say anymore yeah, dogmatic you, about the, these genres yeah yeah uh but uh that's what that's the reaction we were looking for it was like yeah we're doing something right if there's some hater out there that's great you know you're at least there you're you're um they didn't see this one coming you know so uh yeah it was yeah and uh and we used to do like um everything i do i do it for you by brian adams but get the audience to give us chat up lines and put them all into the song um and do it on the stage like so you know that kind of stuff was it was yeah it was definitely an art school thing but um yeah and but like you say add in the brilliant musicianship from the other guys. Um, and that's, that's how I learned. I learned all my, anything I learned is because I realized I was crap and these guys were brilliant and I had to get kind of try and get to their level. And those guys were brilliant, you know, and they still are. Um, and, uh, I'm still trying to get to their level. 
Oh, stop. Yeah, but you're right. I do that as well. I always play with musicians better than me. Like, it's the yeah, only way it, to push yourself. Like, totally. Um, I that that'll be that'll be the best piece of advice. And like the the hard thing, I suppose, is probably trying to get to the point where those musicians will play with you. So you, you're obviously doing something right, Stephen. Well, get them a gig <laughs> if they're going to get paid. They don't care That's how true. shit you are. They're like, there goes diversification. <laughs> book the gig there. Yeah. yeah, that's another thing. Don't sit in your, don't, you don't be sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring. Yeah, try and book a gig. You know, I, I, like I said, when I got the double bass, I'm not blowing me on trouble here. But like, because we're bass players, if you don't book a gig, you won't be, you know, I'm not used to people ringing me with gigs. You know, I've, I've I realized over the years that you're, you are better off trying to put a gig together. And, um, and that's where your network comes in and playing with good people. And like you say, you put something good together that people will want and then get good players to play it and put it like, that's my business, I suppose. I'm not. Mm. I'm not trying to do um, a modern Irish rock album every year or every other year. Um, I'm not. Um, I'm just, you know, playing a few cover versions in, a, trying to freshen it up and make it sound brilliant and sell it to the people and you know, at an event or whatever or a corporate, you know, and uh, and play it as well as possible and put a bit of pizzazz on it. And uh, yeah. but like you know, if you booked, if you do that, you can do that. Anyone can do that. You just you know decide to do it and you it's willpower really is, is all it is um, and don't be afraid to sell yourself either like it, if you're good if you know the band is good you know get yeah. paid what you're worth like yeah and be realistic about yourself i mean i'm i i'd, I'd like to think you know when you asked me to do this i was like um, i see mad why does he want to talk to me you know because like okay maybe the late late is an interesting job but um i'm like like you know i'm not like a a name musician or anything like that i'm just uh i'm just it's 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 a uh, you know i'm a nobody Stephen. um but i'm not a i'm not on i do yeah, have been too irish now that being too self-deprecating being too self deprecating but i don't want to be yeah uh but i uh, i do think i am self-deprecating by nature i think i don't think i'm i think if you're realistic about your abilities and, and where you're at as well it's better because you're, you you know, realize that you can if you're you should always be thinking that you have to work hard at getting better because otherwise you will never get better um and i definitely feel like that all the time but while i'm on that stage and if i can do the job i'm delighted with myself it's the best crack you know so mm. and like it's amazing that i i have a job in the late late still and i'm, I'm still playing and and um, having the fun like like i said I, there was no pathway here that was obvious it was complete fluke really um, well i think someone said was it i think it was i think it was dave swift was saying yeah. people always say to him you're so lucky to be on yeah. The thing and he's he says it's not it wasn't look you might use a different word because i put all yeah. this hard i worked really yeah. hard and if i got the audition for that gig and i wasn't good i wouldn't have got the gig so all the look in the world wouldn't True. have given me this gig like so there's yeah. it's a lot of hard work really as well and then a bit of luck to, for the opportunities to come like yeah, no, no, it is. It is. I mean, like, but like, uh, yeah, I'd be the first to say, though, like I say that um, I'm always play. I always feel like I'm probably the worst musician on the stage. Um, and I don't mind that, you know, I, 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 you know, I know, look, look, I know I put work in to a certain to a level that I'm happy with in a lot of ways. And then I know what I can do the job I do. And, uh, um, and I and I really enjoy it. So that's the the thing. But yeah, like, look, I, I yeah, yeah. Look, I, I'll take that. Uh, Dave is a fan, Dave Swift is a fantastic player. I mean, geez, like you know, and like he he. Um, I suppose I I have that. Um, it's a typically Irish thing, but I have that um, that problem in that I am self taught, and people who are self taught are always going to be like you know um, uh, a, a, a bit uh, wary of saying you know I am brilliant, aren't I? I did it all by myself. When you know you know like I know all the mistakes that I you know could clear. I like let me put it this way. I would love to take two years out now and go back to New Park or somewhere and spend two years studying, like mm. at my age. And, um, you know, it's kind of funny because I, I love it more than ever in a way, playing the bass, you know, it's, and, and I would just enjoy that. And then, and I know if I came out the other side of that, it, it wouldn't make any difference really to my life in terms of, it'd make me a better player. I know it would, because mm. I could be able to practice more than one, an hour a day. Um, but, uh, you know, it probably wouldn't change anybody else's perception of me. It'd be all for myself, you know, because mm. um, I know in my head, I'd be going, I'd love to be better. I'd love to be better. I'd love to have the time to be better. And if I'd only done it before I was 17 or when I only done it in my twenties, um, you know, but like, look, we, we are where we are. This is it. Well, I have to say, I think you're doing an hour a day is class. Like, cause that's, that kind of practice builds yeah. up over time in a serious way. So yeah, you don't, if you can get in an hour a day, like that's really going to yeah, make I, a big difference. Like, 
Well, like, I, I won't lie. I mean, having a pandemic helped in the last two years. <laughs> yeah, there's been a bit of time yeah. for shame. And, and actually, yeah, it was, it was good for the mental health too, because if you're like, I was trapped in the house, I have kids, I was homeschooling. Um, another great thing about this job is that, you know, I was able to do that. And I, like, you know, and we did have, the, like I had the PUP and I could stay home and we managed to make ends meet. And it was great because I actually had a great time with the kids. And, but it allowed me, if I ever felt like, oh God, I'm just like, I'm down or I feel like I'm trapped in this bloody house for the last three months, I'd go in and practice and play music, uh, mm-hmm. even if it wasn't. But usually you know, I have a routine and I, I, I'm always working on something. And, uh, and uh, if you look back over six months, you go, yes, I'm better at that. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah, I think it's nice. I think can, a lot of people can handle an hour um, a day and like, uh, it pays off when you go to do the gig. I, I found it. Did you find it really hard when you came out of the pandemic to do when you did your first gig? You were like, oh my God. I'm yeah, so it was the chops were horrific. Like it's, oh. it's the stuff you don't practice at home, like, you know, the endurance and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And it's like, there's a, there's a definitely a, a, a... doing a podcast. <laughs> Girlfriend's bringing in the dog. <laughs> the dog this is like during the pandemic, isn't it? Everyone interrupts you when you're trying to do oh, stuff. Oh yeah, this is... I said to me, oh yeah, I said to my young fella, because uh, he, he th- that door back there leads to his bedroom, I said, you know, I'm going to be doing a podcast, so you can't, like he's in his pyjamas still probably, I said, you can't be running in and out getting your clothes. <laughs> uh, fix the water problem when I get off the podcast. Fix the water problem? There's oh, no geez. water apparently. There you are, there's the farming background will come back to you there as well. Yeah, yeah. dig a well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all had our own well, didn't we? Um, I can't even remember what we were talking about there, but anyway, there you go. <laughs> I don't know, I've lost my trail of thought now. Um, <laughs> but I uh, know it was class having you on. Uh, really, we, we suppose we were just talking about bass players. It's kind of funny doing a podcast, the whole idea of doing this thing with Irish bass players, because we're all, they're very modest, like, and yeah, even their style of playing is informed by the Irish mentality. They're, they're, yeah. they're class bass players, but they're, none of them are doing the kind of flashy stuff. You know, it doesn't make well, them le- any less good as bass players. Like, you know, I think we're lucky in this country in that as musicians, you can get out there and play um, like there's there's gigs to learn your craft. I mean, when, certainly I'm not sure when I was coming up in the 90s, there'd be three jazz, three or four jazz sessions you go to on a Sunday afternoon to go and look at people playing. You could, you know, there was a lot of little gigs that made mightn't pay very much, but there was a lot of them. And and like and there is, you know, it's maybe it comes from the show band era. There's always been like gigs out there for bands um playing weddings and things like that and and so that craft come back to that crafting and a lot of irish bass players are great at doing their job you know um because they can get that experience maybe that's something that i think the young the younger players nowadays uh you know when we, when i was younger there was no colleges that you could go to really and maybe new Park was there in the 90s but there was no colleges um unless you were going to do the classical thing um there was no bim for instance and you couldn't do rock and pop you know you'd have to go get a private teacher and all that mm. and now now there's a lot of that but there's not as many gigs maybe or there you know um like i learned everything on on the bandstand and i was even talking to the guys in the late late yesterday like jonathan the md he um like he's self-taught as well he's playing the piano he's a drummer but he's playing he's a great piano player play, uh, and normally when he's md and he's behind the kit um and he has the same thing i have you know that, that little bit of lack of confidence because they're self-taught but like you could throw any song at John and you go, yeah, it's a six chord, four chord, five, you know, mm. he, he hears the music and everything, he knows exactly what's going on. And that's from, that's cause that's the job, you know, that kind of way. Um, he's got brilliant ears and he's, uh, and, and if you throw something out, he will be able to do it. Uh, and, and it's not about, like you say, when you, when you have videos of people doing really choppy stuff or um, slap, and tap on the bass let's say that's not practical stuff it's brilliant but it's not practical stuff so irish people irish musicians are great because they've got gigs to learn how to learn the job um i think maybe that's that's just my two cents on it maybe we've had that tradition here of you know bands at weddings and you know paying for entertainment maybe a little bit um and there there were gigs to learn your craft on so that's my theory anyway no, I think you're spot on. So I re- that was class coming on. I'll put your link because t- you have a load of stuff going on. Yeah, we have like the the vintage what's it called the vintage boombox. The boombox, yeah. That where that's the people can check out double your double bass, bass yeah. playing. <laughs> yeah, that's to get me uh, out gigging. Yeah, yeah. If a load of things going on, I'll put them all in links. Would you ever would you ever think of start posting up some stuff on Instagram, kind of bass stuff or 
you never really got into that kind of putting up like the the twenty second or the clips. Like I've of, done like, some like I, I, some playthroughs of some bits and pieces on the Instagram. All right, like I'll put up a cool little if I, like uh, you know a snippet of a song that I'm playing and mm. jamming along with maybe. Um, but yeah, I it's funny. I it's uh it's something you kind of have to think about, isn't it? Like the, your approach to it. I mean, you're doing you're you're doing a great job there. With, like the amount of people you've met and talked to as well. It must be it must feel really gratifying for you to do a podcast like you know you're talking with some big heavyweights and it's you're it's having nice, great conversations yeah. like bass players are very approachable like you know you could yeah. get back to your email which is cool like yeah it's no but it's brilliant like you know i mean these are world-class people you're talking to and stuff and um as and like it's great. yourself you know you're you're part, oh, sure, look. <laughs> you're oh, part sure, look. of that <laughs> but like yeah no i mean i like when when the pandemic came, the, the wife said to me, "We should do some teaching." I said, "I I don't know. I've never been taught, so I don't know if we can do some teaching." And I I, I think it'd be a bit weird for me to start doing lessons on Instagram or whatever. But maybe a bit. I I'll try and do a bit more on it. Maybe just a bit more playing on it. Maybe and stuff. Um. But uh. Yeah. Because I do enjoy it when I do post stuff up on it for the crack. Like. But um, yeah. So I I know. Um. Do you know Niwe, the Congolese guitarist? He lives in Dublin. Oh uh, yeah. Yes. I I I did a movie with him about ten years ago. Oh, really? he, was, yeah, he... he was doing the music for I was record I had to record him and a lo- bunch of Congolese fellas doing um some music for a movie that came out that didn't do very well but anyway he was the he he was the leader of the band he's fantastic mm. yeah and he he's a, an amazing teacher and musician but all he does is just put up like a simple video he's like here's a, a scale or country motion or whatever he's mm-hmm. doing like and it's well, I, you know, stuff. I might do that, Stephen. I might think of something like that. Something that I, that's a good thing. You know, if I come across something cool, I might do that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Because I, I definitely need to do something different. I think I'm kind of, it's not, um, it'd be, uh, I, uh, I need to think about it. Let's put it that way and uh, <laughs> find a new approach. Yeah, yeah. We'll look forward to seeing it anyway. So cheers for coming on. I'll check you out on the late, late night. While I'm off now for the next few weekends, I'll oh, good definitely man. check it out. And I'll be Enjoy seeing your if you're miming or not. Like. <laughs> <laughs> you can message me <laughs> and I'll tell you <laughs> uh, uh, yeah I haven't even posted anything about sorry I just popped this in my, I haven't posted much about the late late actually since I came back so I'm going to start doing that as well um, give a shout out to all the guys in the band there and the girls um, it's, uh, it's a bit of crack you know yourself but um, yeah I look forward to your feedback Stephen thank you very much for having me on no bother <laughs>